This is the DRS train. Today, we saw some of the shoddiest racing, the scrappiest pit stops, and the dumbest strategies I've ever seen. And all I have to say is, thank you. I'm Peter Brook, I'm joined by Kyron Smith and Navif1, and you're listening to the DRS Train Podcast. Gentlemen, that was a bit of fun, wasn't it? That was great. Honestly, I loved it, and I know that that has to do with the, the lower standards of racing we got at the front, but I loved it. Some of the most ridiculous driving I've seen in quite a while. Um, we'll, we'll get into that. But I uh, can't argue with what you said at the start, Peter. That was an exciting race. Um, so a lot to dissect. I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, when he was interviewed at the end, Max said, like, every so often you just need a race like that to kind of reinvigorate things. And I think Formula One needed that because um, I, I, something I've noticed re is that I don't often go into races actually excited to watch them. Like, for the past few years, that hasn't really been the case. And I wasn't necessarily expecting miracles from this one. And then I saw it was wet at the beginning. And I was like, oh, well, this is good. And then it got even better because the race stewards decided to actually let them race instead of doing a, a safety car or or waiting it out or whatever. Um but yeah, all, all round, I can't really, in, t in terms of entertainment, I can't really complain. I mean, there is a lot to complain about in terms of driving because we saw a lot of really, a lot of errors from a lot of people. Um, almost everyone had some kind of major mistake at some point. Um, someone who had some of the fewer mistakes, though, was Max. And races like this demonstrate why he wins all the time, if I'm Yeah, good place to start is just the guy who won. I think Max today really showed why he is still the gloss of the field and any hater he might have at the moment or any person who might doubt that he's only good because of his car, both Saturday and Sunday this weekend showed that this guy is properly fast. He's not just there to, he's not just there because of the car. He's there because he knows how to drive it. He went off the road once, didn't he? Um, near the start, I think, and um, that wasn't great. But apart from that, you have to say he was relatively error free when everyone around him looked they were like looked like they were the new boy at school again. I mean, everybody was making some kind of mistake, looking nervous, you know, misjudging things, whether it was breaking zones at overtake. Max showed that he really is head and shoulders clear of everyone in his generation. Um and I still think the only two drivers that are even close to him are Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso, as much as it pains me to say that. So this really was a race that showed Max's skill. And it's not just that he has a great car, because we heard on the radio there were some issues with the ride this weekend during the race. And his teammate was nowhere. I mean, Perez was a complete joke this entire race. And if you look where Max was, not only did he overcome those ride issues, he beat what I think were some faster cars again on the day. So uh, stellar drive by Max, it, it has to be said, just to add to your point there. Yeah, I mean, this was interesting because, um, I mean, yesterday and the day before, it definitely wasn't the best car. And you could see that from the lap times, but also Max's general comments. And I think Red Bull knew that a circuit like this with lots of low speed corners tends not to work quite so well for them. Um, but it... Even so, like today, I don't think it was the fastest car overall. I think Mercedes definitely had the faster car, but they were burdened by the fact that Lewis was starting further back and then George kept making lots of mistakes. Um, didn't help them. But even so, people will say, oh, look how flustered Max gets when the car's not the best or when he's not running at 100% or whatever. And it's like, to be honest, I think he was driving as well as he always drives. The benchmark usually is that the car is not so good, is that he'll match the pole time and so lose pole by exactly nothing, whereas his teammate will get knocked out in Q1 if the car is not the best. I mean, the difference is astronomical, really, with Checo, because we, I mean, going into this week, there was that, he got that insane contract, having another two years added to his time at Red Bull, having just, you know, got himself knocked out in Q1 in Monaco, and now he's done it again. Um, and then, yeah, ran around at the back doing nothing and then hit the wall. Um, I did see earlier, apparently his contract is actually a one plus one. So mm -hmm. theoretically, they could have him out for 26 and maybe throw in Sunoda because, again, he's got another year added on. And if things continue like this, that's probably what's going to happen. Um, but now it's, it's, it, the gap is only getting wider and wider. And you're left thinking what kind of, what stranglehold that Checo must have. Or he's in the no one that meant he can get such a good contract like that. How much money is Delmex pumping in? Because that's the only thing I'm wondering here. Well, it's not just Telmex, is it? I mean, he has so many sponsors. Um, and 
I don't think there's a driver on the grid that attracts as many sponsors. I was looking at the list um, of sponsors that he brings in, and he has deals with Disney, Mobile One, Claro, Nest Cafe, Kit Kat, Telmex. He's got Carlos Slim behind him. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's ever been a driver in modern history that's backed by so many people. And you might be wondering, why are they backing him? Why are they backing this mid-level driver? The reason is because he has nationality from a country that has a massive GDP, that has a very connected fan base of people who like watching sports in Mexico and who are heavy consumers of products in general. So when you combine those two elements, he's just a super attractive driver for the sport to have and for sponsors to back. They get a return on their investment. So if this was based on talent, he would be nowhere near a front running seat. This is just sh shambolic stuff. I mean, out in Q1, what was he doing in the race? As Martin Brundle said, was he even racing? Well, the only time I noticed him is when his rear wing was falling off when he crashed. So, you know, that only makes Max look better, but at the same time, somebody else would do a better job in that seat you know one plus one is that what his deal was peter it should be a zero plus zero deal in my opinion yeah i mean i'm left wondering if um if this continues they can't possibly abide by that contract i mean legally the earliest they could do is just keep him until the end of next year but even so they're going to be like this is not on they might have to just try and break it before then um i because now we all, I think everyone is seeing the horizon on the horizon that he could well cost them the constructors champion. Um, because I have I keep tracks, I do a, a qualifying championship where I just do points for quality. I think he's eighth now, he's on about 80 points, whereas on max is on over 200, and that's just qualifying. And then in the races, it's not it's not translating, and it just didn't go anywhere. So, I mean, at the beginning, he had a collision with Gasly, although I think that was Gasly's fault, to be honest. And then we saw, I think there was, I saw him overtake someone once for 15th, and then hits the wall but it's just it, it, it's frustrating because you know that's I'm, I'm one of the ones that keep saying that Tsunoda should go in there but then again Tsunoda had a bit of a mare that just not a brilliant race on his end either and made his own errors um and maybe I'm coming for this from a, a British perspective I've never understood the market size with him because I'm not from Mexico I'm not from Latin America or anything um so I'm just like he's just there just that midfield guy that's been there for like forever that's, yeah all of this is giving me some hope that Kushmaili bullshits his way into an Alpine seat next year because massive GDP, huge sports culture. Indian driver mainly could be in the running for Alpine, the Alpine seat for all we know. Maybe it's not going to be doing, but um, more seriously, Perez and his and his one plus one contract. That's one of the worst ways. Well, maybe in history you guys have other examples, but that's one of the worst post renewal races I've ever seen. Get out in Q one in a in a race winning car and then spin on your own when you're not even properly chasing or being chased that that was such a bad weekend and you know he, he's gotten us used to having some of these bad weekends but i think this one might be one of his worst ones yet in his f1 career you know you mentioned another driver there nav and you're like well i don't you know you wouldn't be surprised if you saw him go through because he's also from a big economy but remember Hispanics are not just prominent in Latin America. The United States has many of them as well. Many of the fans who are American fans are of Mexican or Guatemalan or Nicaraguan heritage. And before F1 really took off in the US, if you looked in the stands of Austin, pre-Drive to Survive, the majority of those fans were of Latin American Hispanic heritage. The Paris is just a powerful economic chip that Red Bull have right now, beyond maybe anything I've seen. He's backed by one of the most powerful men on the planet, Carlos Slim. I don't really see him under threat, even if he underperforms in his one plus one, as long as the sponsors stay on board, which they will. So this is a clear cut case of sponsorship and money just completely overshadowing talent. and. You know, it's really costing us because, frankly speaking, um, every race that goes by could be a race that someone else could be challenging for the win in that Red Bull. And yet we have to, we're subjected to Red Bull being knocked out in Q1, which invariably makes the races less interesting because you want as many people fighting at the front 
as possible. So anyways, I'll close a loop on that. But uh, I mean, look, it's totally unacceptable. He's just not good enough. He's just not good enough. Yeah, what it makes me think of is um, early 2010s when we had this basically this three-way battle with um, Red Bull, McLaren and Ferrari is that there were three, t there were six drivers, but it was only ever a five-way battle because Massa yes. was the one that was just absolutely nowhere. And so that's basically what we've got, although we've got kind of, it's hard to tell after a race like this if it's three or four teams because the third team got replaced in that, in that Ferrari had one of their worst weekends in a very long time, probably. Probably one of the worst weekends they've had since, I don't know, 2020, 2014, one of those. Um, and that's making you... Yeah, it's. Just, I'm just enjoying the fact that now things are closer, but for Perez, it makes it more perilous because last year he could just about get away with it because Max was able to carry the team completely. But now that is clearly not the case because we've got McLaren and Ferrari and to a lesser extent Mercedes all starting to push them more. Yeah. How does Perez like, walk around the paddock with such confidence? Like, yeah, I'm Sergio Perez and my teammate outscored me by 290 points last season. Want my autograph? No, I don't, mate. And it's um, it's shocking. Quickly on the Ferrari point, it's uh, it really exposed a weakness in their car. And uh, I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again. That team has uh, one of the quickest, if not the quickest car around certain tracks. But the weakness they also have is that in certain conditions, they're good. And in certain conditions, they suffer, namely when it gets cold, because they have demonstrated consistently that their car has an issue maintaining an optimal tire pressure and optimal tire performance window they quickly lose grip as soon as it gets a little bit cold and they have a really difficult time generating the tire temps which is why leclerc and signs were just sliding around and qualifying and in the race like you said one of the worst weekends i can remember from the scuderia as well so it comes back to their tire deficiencies in my opinion and the inability for them to keep tire temperatures and also, I mean, it doesn't help that uh, Carlos Sainz made a horrific mistake in the race as well. So, uh, mechanical and car issues, fundamental chassis issues, and uh, driver issues, it seems. Not good enough. Yeah, I think with Ferrari, it was just all of their weaknesses all at once, because as well as this evidently not being one of their better circuits, um, what made things even worse is that when they were both knocked out in Q2, I'm pretty certain they were still on used softs on their final runs. Um, and that is like, okay, well, if they put them on new tires, they would have got in. But then in the race, they weren't, they weren't going forwards. I mean, not, I'm trying to think because Leclerc, I don't remember him being a particularly strong wet weather driver. Um, because if you think like Germany 2019, he spun off from a podium place. 2020, he lost the podium right at the last second in Turkey. Um, There's more. Uh, yeah, There's Germany, yeah, Germany 2018, he did a, some ballerina spins in the Sauber. But yeah, so I mean, we don't get many wet races these days. But yeah, basically, he's not he's not that good in wet weather. It seems science, maybe it's a similar deal. But yeah, even so, in the race, they just weren't going anywhere. Leclerc was had some weird intermittent op problem with the engine, and then they pitted and did a control alt delete, which seemed to fix it. But then they decided to put him on hards when they could see it was about to shit it down. And it's like, okay, yeah, this is we're back to classic Ferrari now. I was watching it with mates, and we laughed so hard when he said. It's raining, and they said, "No, it's fine. You're going to be fast." They, they basically said that, which is utterly insane. They basically gaslighted him into thinking you're going to be fine. The rain is going to stop, or even if the rain didn't stop, that the hards would start working after three laps on a wet track. And he was struggling. He was so clearly struggling. And when I say struggling, it's losing eight lap, eight seconds per lap. And the the dumbest thing is. That was after all the uh, electrical issues or whatever. So he was already having a bad time. And then they put him... So, no, th then they put him on inters. He gets lapped. So they could have just retired the car. But no, he, he goes through the, the humiliation of after having the perfect weekend in Monaco, slows down on the uh, straight uh, on the start-finish line, lets everyone through from P1 to P5. He lets everyone through, and then they retire him after three laps. It seemed like they were humiliating him on purpose, which they weren't. That's the kind of thing that Alpine would do on Ocon or something. But no, they weren't. They were just, they, they just made that race just hell for Leclerc for no reason at all. Um, and yeah, just after he had the weekend of his life, he just had probably one of the most 
painful races so far. Yeah, I think when they retired him, I'm guessing it was just because they were like, there's no point continuing rather than the, the problem coming back. Because, yeah, as you said, that by then they were they were a lap down. Um, but uh, Sites had, he didn't try these inventive strategies or anything like that. Um, but then he just managed to spin on his own, exiting turn six, collects Albon when, again, that probably could have been, if he'd braked a bit harder, that maybe could have been avoided because Albon tried to dodge him and still got clipped by him and then he's like drifting in circles in the grass trying to get out um the, the official reason is he, he hit a wet batch on the turn which well i think everyone understood that but um yeah well we're gonna get on to williams next because Albon had a good race but science and Perez spinning on their own because they hit wet batches those aren't rookies those aren't sergeant and now the williams driver we're going to talk about those are experienced drivers at top teams. You, you you cannot just be spinning on your own because it's wet. Yeah, I mean, Sainz was in the wars today, wasn't he? There was an incident between him and Bottas and Ricardo as well um, at the restart. He was off the pace. At least Leclerc had power unit or some kind of engine issue that was halting his progress. Sainz just wasn't good enough today. I mean, what's he doing spinning like a top into a Williams? Uh, and the follow-on question to that is, why on earth is he racing at Williams in the first place? So, you know, Carlos needs to uh, go away from this weekend and think about, you know, the things he can improve for um, weekends like this. Because sometimes he has these weekends, doesn't he, where he just kind of drifts into anonymity and starts hitting things. So, um, you know, he, he'll want to uh, he'll, he'll want to cut those out wherever he goes next. But, I think the biggest problem I, I have with um, Ferrari is that if they really want to be the third team, because McLaren have arrived, McLaren are regularly challenging Red Bull for wins now. If Ferrari want to turn this into a three-way title fight, they don't have much time because McLaren is there. Red Bull is there. Mercedes now have momentum. Ferrari can't have weekends where they win one race and then qualify 12th the next. That's just not acceptable or the way you fight for a title. So for the sake of F1, I really hope, and for the sake of this championship, they can find a way to address the issues with their tire warm up and, and whatever else is preventing them from performing in, in conditions and circuits like this. Um, it'll just be, it'll be better for Formula One if they do. Right now, too inconsistent. There is a certain irony in the collision that, um sites had because all week the talks have been about how williams are actually very interested in getting him as a driver next year and he he i think he came out today saying he's still looking at his options and it's like well with red bull being locked in you're running out of options at this point so maybe it should just be any port in the storm and take williams because your only other option is sauber at this rate Alpine, um, watch Alpine come back for science like they did in 2017 that would be fun mm. Or even I don't know, even Haas could be a thing. It's like Williams at least have a plan and a vision, even if they're incapable yeah. of executing it. Um, but yeah, I don't think that would have helped him because um, we're not talking about Williams yet. But but they, they, I know that last year they said that they tend to um, prioritize certain races where they really want to perform well, and Canada is one of those because they're straight line merchants and the car is good. So this obviously really, really scuppered that because I think he was probably in the points or not far off points. I mean, Albon was going back and forth, but yeah. Um, Ferrari, it, it's just that in the race that he he wasn't the one having, you know, engine problems and creative strategies and all of this, and he, he still was not making any progress. And um, when it could have given us, it could have given us a four-way fight in, in the end, and it, uh, still a very good three-way one, but we could have had four, four teams right like that at the front. Well, a question for you guys on this. How hard do you think it was to overtake in the pack today? Because it all comes down to this, right? It... Was it that hard that, you know, we can excuse Sainz and Peppers? Or as Albon showed, for example, again, he is a straight line merchant, but he was making the moves. So was it a case of wet conditions, too hard to overtake in the wet now, or some drivers not being courageous enough? One thing I did notice is it's really hard now to overtake on the start finish straight because it's too short for those cars. So by the time you get next to another car, the turn one is coming. So you used to have a lot of switchbacks there. So a car would overtake going into the chicane and another the, the, the overtaken car would cut back at you. But now it's basically if you get the move done uh, by the chicane, it's, it's over. 
I think if it had been a dry race, it would have been easier on the start finish straight because overtaking was complicated in that section of the track because we we never had a the track was never completely dry offline. It was still damp at the end of the race. But to be honest, I think overtaking looks easier than it ever has been this year, at least. I mean, in the dry, there were lots on the back straight. In the wet, I guess if you were on the right tire, like Haas demonstrated it, you could overtake quite easily. And I think if you ignore visibility issues, being wet races do create more opportunities because people can take different lines and it's and you can rely on people in front of you making mistakes. And corner exit becomes really important. So I don't think there was necessarily problems I don't think it was necessarily harder to overtake. It was just whether you had the, the guts to give it a go, really. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's um, it's always tricky in these changeable conditions because it comes down to who has the confidence and who has the who has really the car under them to make a move. And um, we saw some drivers simply showing their bravery and, and that paid dividends. Uh, so it didn't look challenging. It just, you had to be careful. Otherwise, you'd be running into another driver or spinning and crashing. So. Um, I think overtaking was fine. I did want to point out how narrow the start finish line, start finish straight looked this year when they showed the aerial shot. I think it's just because the cars are so wide, like like we all mentioned, that the track really does look a little bit narrower than it, than it has, let's say, in some previous iterations. But overtaking is still very possible, especially on this circuit and especially in these conditions. And people aren't really as precise given the conditions. So I don't think that was a big problem. Um, there are some other circuits where it's a big problem, but I don't think it was a big problem this weekend. I think it was fairly easy. Well, talking about just the truck for a bit, uh, you guys might have seen that they removed the grass on the outside of, like it's turn three, and they um, they put some tarmac on it. So basically, you can take more. Uh, yeah, you, you can go on the outside more before attacking that chicane, and they also removed some. Um, they removed the grass at the exit of well, that, that second fast left, right. I think that's turn six and seven. Um, so basically, again, they're, they're, ex they're excusing mistakes a bit more. Well, you, you just have more space, which I guess they're justifying with the fact the cars are bigger, so you need more space. But, you know, the, those drivers should cope with the width of the truck. I, I don't, again, Canada is a really good truck. I don't see why they have to make it essentially larger for the drivers. I thought they added grass instead of runoff at certain corners, like turns um, turns eight and nine or seven and eight. I think they didn't put, they put grass where they used to be runoff or something or gravel. So they yeah, actually added it. But I think on turn three, they, they removed the grass and they put tarmac. So they, they changed a few yeah. things. Um, yeah, they're kind of, I mean, because they put that really weird, like blue kind of gravel at turn one. But just on the or turn two, but just on the actual turn itself, so you could still cut across it because we saw that several drivers um, didn't make the first corner and had to cut across. Um, yeah, they're still making slow changes. I mean, there are some corners, like for example, the final, the Wall of Champions chicane, it, it, putting grass or gravel is not uh, realistic um, and it will just cause more accidents, I think. Um, but um, yeah, we, they, they are listening, I think, in some of the other, we've seen other circuits this year, they've started putting more grass and, and, and less gravel in. Um, yeah, it's just a good, it's, it's a good circuit in general. Um, it's one of the better ones. It's just that it, it, it does really need rain to deliver properly, I find. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, we talked about the, the few disappointments of the race to start with. Um, just to make it clear, I think all of us enjoyed that race. So it's not like we're saying it was only about disappointments. There were also some very good moments. And you just mentioned the World of Champions. The overtake of Alex Albon, going into Williams now, the overtake of Alex Albon on, uh, was it Tsunoda and Ocon, I think? Or, or was it Ricardo and uh, He went Ocon? through, I can't remember, I, I missed that one, but I, I heard it rather than saw it. Um, yeah, it, it was an RB and then Ocon. Um, that was, I kid you not, one of the best overtakes I've seen. It, it was Ricardo and Ocon. It was Ricardo and Ocon. Yes. And he had to yes, afford it. Was the lead of he had to avoid crashing into the back of the Alpine. And so that kind of forced his hand into making two moves, yeah. you know? So it was a good one. And yeah, good one. personally, I, I found that it was, it was just really nice. But also, yeah, Ocon was on slow tires and he basically had to avoid Ocon, but he had the reflexes to do it. And in general, Williams had a good race. Well, 
one of the drivers had a good race. And interestingly, I'm sure you guys will have noticed, Albon even gave credit to Sargent during the post quality interview, saying that Sargent was faster all weekend. And yeah, I, I was also noticing that during Q1 and even during free practice, Sargent was faster. He, it didn't work out for him in quality, but again, during the race, in a race where he should feel confident, where Alex Albon is praising him publicly, you, there's no use in, I mean, there's no sense to be made when he just spins on his own for no reason. And he was nowhere. He I just mean, I mean, that's all well and fine, but, you know, Alex Albon can say whatever he wants, frankly. Um, it doesn't really matter unless you deliver on the day, and the day is Sunday. And Logan Sargent tends not to deliver on Sundays uh, for whatever reason. I mean, made a completely unforced error and wasted any potential he may have had this weekend. And it's probably why he will no longer be driving for Williams next year. He makes way too many mistakes. This is his second season in Formula One. And uh, I still look at him as a rookie. It's not good. You know, I still forget that this guy has actually driven an entire season in Formula One. It doesn't really feel like that. And uh, Williams can't really afford that. I'm not saying that Logan doesn't have flashes of speed and Logan had more raw speed than Alex this weekend. Yes, but it's kind of irrelevant if you can't convert that. And um, with the cost cap and everything in Formula One now, crashing is more costly than ever. So uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid Logan just isn't cutting it. And today was an example of that. Yeah, that example, I mean, that, that fact you used, the fact he's in his second year right now, I don't feel like I ever think about Piastri and Sargent having the, the same number of races. Piastri seems like an experienced, composed head even during his, I mean, even his, in his team radios, he, he seems to know what he's doing. And then you have Logan, who seems like he has five less years of experience, and that's not good. Yeah, I mean, so in qualifying, it was obvious at least he was cl very close to Albon. Uh, I mean, initially he was beating him in Q1 and Q2, but then Albon was stuck in the garage of problems. But then at the end of the day, Albon made it to Q3, and Sargent didn't, so he still got beaten by him. But I thought they would do better, or at least not make Q1, because it was changing conditions. But again, as I said, Canada is one of their stronger circuits. And, it, and because they know that, it's one that they tend to prioritize to try and get a good result. Um, and yet, yeah, first few laps, he was just running in 15th. I think he, he went backwards a little bit at the start, running in 15th. And then, and then he goes off by himself at turn whatever, turn, turn four or five, um, turn six. Um, he, he did go off, actually, at the um, Le Ponga hairpin on the way around to the grid as well. But it was just like, because at that point, nobody else was making any mistakes. And I was thinking, okay, we're getting, it's a wet race. We're getting a standing start. This is going to be interesting. Very gentlemanly start from everyone. Nobody was doing anything wrong. And it's like, this kind of showed for me just the discrepancy between him and, the, and every, basically everyone else on the grid now. Because he was the first one. He went off once and then reversed and came out. And then he goes and crashes and triggers a safety car. Um, and it's like 10 years ago, half the grid would have done what he'd done in conditions like that. I mean, they basically did in 2011. But now it's we don't see nearly as many mistakes from other people and he's still doing it and again it's a race where he probably couldn't have got points but he would have finished and finished in the top 15 for once and probably got a best a best result of the season um and it, it's just annoying because they're they are more james is more openly basically saying that he's a liability like he was like we need two world cast drivers in this car which is why they're looking at signs but now we're a year and a half in and they're just there has not been any improvement at all like there's literally none well said very well said peter and uh yeah nice reference to james vale's underhanded slight to logan he did say he needs two world-class drivers but presumably that also means uh albon might be on the chopping block i mean i don't consider albon world-class maybe james does you know if i were to be you know facetious and somewhat you know take a humorous spin on this what would Logan have done in Malaysia 2001? What would he have done in Brazil 2003? What would he have done in Fuji 2007? What would he have done in Silverstone 2008? Like even Sochi 2021. Is a, is a Sochi 2021. Exactly now. What would he have done if he couldn't handle conditions like this? These were not the worst conditions we've ever seen. This was just simply wet. Finally, we got a, a wet race. But, you know, we need to also understand, like, we have seen 
upon magnitudes of order worse conditions than what we saw on during the race today. I mean, this was not the toughest conditions any of those veterans at the front have raced in or even close. So that's what also shocked me at how many mistakes I was seeing because this wasn't really like a Brazil 2003 track. This was like magnitudes way, way less than that, way less standing water, you know, much more grip than that. But I think it comes down to driving errors and unfocused drivers, but it also comes down to Pirelli. And I know I've beaten this horse several times, but the tires are not good enough. They're just not good enough. And uh, I think part of the reason we see so many crashes is that these drivers just don't have the confidence on these tires that they did 20 years ago during the tire war. Um, but it still doesn't excuse the number of incidents we saw because the track itself wasn't that wet compared to some prior wet races we've seen. So uh, Sargent was probably the worst driver on the day, but we could go through, you know, 75% of the grid and point out an un unforced error they made during this weekend. And given the conditions, I just found that totally unacceptable, guys. Like, this was not a monsoon. This was not pouring rain. This was just some damp, changeable conditions in a damp circuit. Why the need for all this chaos? Just keep it on the road, boys. Just keep it on the road, for goodness sakes. Goodness sakes. I mean, I was actually quite impressed by how the tyres behaved today because, um, I mean, there seems to have been a consensus over the past couple of seasons that the extreme wet tyre is basically useless and you just can't go anywhere near it. Um, but Haas made it work, I mean, only for five laps, but they showed you can race on it. And at the beginning, it it, it was the right tyre for a bit, but then it ended up not working out because it dropped off too quickly. But also they were, well, Magnussen, his slow pit stop, and then they left Hogenberg out way too long. So they just ended up back square one. Um, but I was amazed actually by how wide the kind of wind operation window was for the intermediates because it went all the way from being very wet at the beginning, very cold with lots of standing water, and then we they were like Lando was still running it several laps into a dry line being there, and it was still working. Yes. Like, I was like, it's that that is an extremely versatile tire. Right? Yeah, that's a good point. The stint lengths were much longer than I thought were possible for some of these drivers. And on the inter, and it does have versatility. Um, I, my, the jury's still out for me when it comes to the full wet tire. Just because Magnuson and Hulkenberg were the only two on it in the beginning doesn't make it a good tire. I mean, when we have a pouring race and a monsoon, and the FIA let them race, and we get feedback from the drivers that the tires are suitable, then maybe I'll change my mind. But I still think there's a deficiency there. But I do acknowledge that the that the range of the inter tire in particular today. Was, was amazing, and the stint lengths some people were able to eke out on them were equally impressive. So so maybe I'll backtrack and say there's been some improvement from Pirelli um, from the criticism we've heard in recent years, but I still think there's something something there that can be potentially improved. Anyways, it doesn't really excuse the, uh, the number of errors that we saw, um, I suppose. So that's a good point, Peter, I acknowledged. Yeah, I was gonna move on to well, the, the front runners of this race were covered in Mercedes, but because of this conversation, I just want us to touch on Haas already. I'm just so happy that they did what they did, because if you are a backmarker and if you see these conditions, this is when you gamble. And for too many years, you just see backmarkers do what others do. And the most you'll get is always starting from the pit lane, which means nothing. I don't know, I, I used to, well, of course, during the, the times of uh, fuel, but also just even with tires, I, I remember when I would watch in 2008 or 09, I, I would, if there was a wet track, everyone was starting on a different thing, or you would especially have back markers doing some wacky shit, basically. And, you know, 2007, Winklehock leading the, the European Grand Prix, that would have never happened if Spiker didn't think, oh, yeah, let's just try. So I'm just glad, firstly, that has tried. It worked, and you know, I I feel like this the charge of Magnussen for the first four or five laps is something that is going to be used in F1 retrospective videos because it's the kind of thing that F1 is about just a back marker trying something and then just storming through the field from P14 to P4. I mean, I think everyone smiled or at least just laughed a bit when they saw 
Magnus and what was it? Make up two seconds and a half on Piastri at some point. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen this before from from Haas. Um, twenty twenty Hungary, they both went into the pit lane in the formation lap, and I think put intermediates on or some something like that. And doing that meant that Magnussen got a point and possibly their only point that year, or one of only a couple of points they got that year. Um, and yeah, it was like thank you for doing something different, just because it make otherwise it's everyone's on the inters and they just run around like a train. Uh, it's just it's annoying because at first yeah they were making a lot of gains I mean Magnussen was up to fourth and then it started tipping off and then they waited too long to pit them again that was what annoyed me because it's like the, the track is only going to get dry and I think they were hoping they could make the um the, the the extreme wets last and go to slicks but that almost never happens especially when the sun is out and so they they pitted Magnussen at a good time but then he had such a slow stop that he came out about five places below where he would have been. And then they left Hulkenberg out way, way too long. And they were, and I was when he was going to like four or five seconds a lap slow. It's like okay, he's losing an entire pit stop just by staying out. So it's just just get them in, get them in earlier. And if it means, yeah, because I know they were anticipating everyone else is going to have to pit as well, and we've just done an extra stop for the same tires. It's like we well, you have to just think a bit, a bit faster. And so when they rejoined, they were right at the back, and then they finished the race at eleventh and twelfth at the end. Do you know exactly when? It- where Hulkenberg was when he pitted for drives. Oh, well, not drives. Well, he pitted. He was behind Lewis, and then he start, He he nearly passed Lewis yeah. for sixth, and then he just fell backwards. I think he was almost, he was about 15 seconds down on Lewis when he did pit, and there was a big train of cars behind him. Yeah. So, so he'd lost almost an entire pit stop. Yeah, so that, that, after I said Haas did really well, this made me so angry. Why did they pit Magnussen for... Uh, inters at that point because I know you you're saying that it was a move to make, but at that point he was 17 seconds ahead of Hülkenberg or whoever was in P7 or P8. He could have easily just stayed on that tire until it gets dry, or just because it's Hülkenberg who is backing up backing up people, he could just stay there. He, he wasn't going to lose that much time. And I have no idea why has pitted Magnussen because. Sure, if the pit stop was absolutely perfect, he comes out in the back, not even ahead of the back, in the back. But today was an easy way of scoring points because he, he was running P4. And sure, he, he would have lost time, but th- this is way too cautious. Th- there was there was space for like a solid P7 or P8 for Magnussen today. And when you know what Haas is capable of doing with their second driver, you keep the first driver, you just let the dr- first driver race and see what happens yeah but did magnuson make that call to pit by himself because it seemed that when he pitted nobody was ready for him so if he did then it's fine if he did I, I, then that's fine i think all just the drivers weird. make i think all the drivers make calls in races like this because it's wet and they they the track better than the, the pit wall them it was just odd that nobody was i mean he lost a lot of time in that pit stop because it, nobody was ready for him so i mean he had a heavily delayed stop so that just points to more operational deficiencies at, at, at Haas, perhaps, because, um, you know, you're in a good position. You want to make the most out of it. They kind of blew their chances right there with, with a slow pit stop right away. So, you know, their race was uh, their race lost momentum pretty quickly um, from maybe a hasty stop, as you mentioned, Nav, but also just not being ready for their driver when he comes into the pit lane. Like this is like this is basic stuff right like nine second pit stops are not going to help you when you're fighting for points so uh, a shame shame really i mean with both of them pitting was the right decision because there was no possible way that they could make those extreme wets last um and to, to go on to to go on to slicks um but i think like everyone else they were anticipating more rain coming um but they they what they i mean with, with magnuson maybe they should have they should have pitted him maybe a lap earlier and then not had the slow stop and I think there was a big enough gap. They could have pitted both of them on the same lap. Um, but Magnuson, the main issue was that it was a slow stop because it was called maybe a bit too late and it would have been called by him because in a wet race, normally the driver makes the first call in kind of transitional periods because they have a much better understanding and feeling of the track than the pit wall does. Um, but the thing with Hulkenberg is they left him out like seven or eight laps way too long and he'd already lost more than a pit stop just by staying out and then they lost even more. And he rejoined, I think, in 18th. Or something. So either way, they had to pit again, and that's not their fault because I think at the beginning of the race, nobody really knew how it was going to go. Um, but and they were unfortunate in because they ended up it very quickly became the slower tire. It's just that they then 
augmented this by having a slow stop and keeping them out for too long. My point about Hülkenberg is he he fell back to getting overtaken by Ricardo and the others. So he, he fell back to like P11 before pitting and then yes, he comes out in P18. But Magnussen was 15 seconds ahead. So there's so much more margin there for staying out. Um, well, my, my point is more that, you know, has aren't meant to be there. So if you're in fourth, you gamble and you do something that can lead to a miracle. And for me, that miracle was just let K-Mag race, hope on a safety car, hope on a red flag, because in the end, he, they, they did all this and they finished P11 and P12. That's no point. Yeah, I mean, Magnussen, he, when he was in his, his, his charge stopped when he got to Piastri and he was within DRS range of yeah. him initially. And then it was when he dropped to about five, six seconds behind that they pitted him. Um, yeah. So they, th 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 the way they should have taken it is, okay, we're out of position and this is a very unfortunate place, but we do need, is that, okay, the track is drying. These tires are not going to last much longer. We need to pit. Um, but if we, if when we pit, we come out higher than our grid positions, and then that's basically a victory because that means that we're at the same, now we're on the same tire as everyone else. So we're sort of on equal terms again. Um, but our tires are fresher too. So that that's kind of the position they had is that, okay, we're in the points now, but we're not going to be for much longer. And they just kept hanging on for way, way too long and made it even worse because otherwise they could, I mean, they finished just behind the Alpines. Um, if they pitted them faster and sooner, they definitely could have beaten them and come ninth, 10th, maybe eighth. I don't know. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. The more I think about it, it's a missed opportunity for us. They did all they did everything right in the beginning and then they didn't follow through with it, isn't it? So uh lots of work there for that team. Um I'm not really sure how they're gonna improve. They just seem to be stagnant, but yeah, this was a missed opportunity. I mean the fact that Alpine finished ahead of them when you think about it is uh is ridiculous alpine were nowhere in the beginning of this race so uh lots of lots of work there um moving on from haas quickly i mean who else interested you guys at that phase of the race personally i thought mclaren uh you know really turned up the heat early on with norris making two moves on verstappen and russell respectively um that was quite impressive i mean it really speaks to how good mclaren are they were flying yeah, I mean, McLaren is, it's another, in qualifying yesterday, they were sort of there, but not quite there. They were kind of threatening Mercedes. I mean, Mercedes were the real standouts in qualifying yesterday. And McLaren was sort of just behind them, just behind Red Bull. But in the race, like Lando especially really kind of fired up immediately. Like Piastri, he was always near the front, but he, the front, but he was never really threatening for a win at any point. But he was always just kind of just behind there. And he didn't have any many errors. But then Lando kept making mistakes. I mean, okay, the, the safety car was unfortunate, although to be honest, maybe he should have just pitted at the, when, when Max and George did, because they're not his teammates, so they doesn't have to worry about double stacking or anything. But just doing that extra lap was just enough for him to lose the lead. Um, but then he had, I forgot, I mean, every driver had offs at almost every corner, ex basically except Max at one point. And so he kept doing stuff like that, and that made it, meant it just didn't work out. But the, pa the pace is absolutely there now. Peter, careful about how you talk about driver of the day, Lando Norris, because that was one. He he had another one where it was an absurd driver of the day. I can't remember. Maybe you. Um, Brazil was... last year. Yes. Yeah, that was the one. Today he he wasn't even the best McLaren driver, so I don't know how he can be the best driver of the race. He asked you a small thing on him. The reason why he he wasn't overtaking Lando was so clearly team orders for me because even when Lando went off. Um, when chasing George, was it? Yes, when, when no, when chasing Max, he goes off, and you see Oscar just back off completely. So he, he lets George by and he just uh, backs off completely because he does not want to overtake Lando. And during the entire race, even when um, Oscar was really close, you see that he would just back off by like four or five attempts. So, look, it, it's fine for now. He's still in his second year, start of second year. He's still being a very kind driver, second driver, clearly second driver at McLaren, and he's abiding by all the rules. So, you know, it's quite nice to see. Obviously, I know Kyron wants more uh, racing mentality from those drivers. I think it's fine for now, but if in his third year he does this, it's too late because we are getting to this 
point where Oscar can really challenge Lando. So it's fine if he does it for a few more races, but he, he needs to start getting confident enough to be like, guys, can we swap positions? I think I'm faster because that, that's what happens in top teams. He did that as well in the safety car um, when Lando, as I said before, did a lap later and he came out in third, is that he slowed down just enough to get Lando out past the safety mm -hmm. car line first. Yeah. Um, and I guess it was team orders, but also thinking, okay, well, it's not really fair for him to come out behind me because it's the safety car, even if Lando's call was to stay out a lap later or or whatever. It just meant that for him is that it was just it just became a surprisingly quiet race. I mean, aside from the part the pass or the attempted pass from George towards the end where they did touch and nearly had a big crash and then I think they're both they are something at the moment of recording yeah. just to make yeah, it yeah they're clear. both under I don't know if the penalty to come out yet or anything for that but um yeah other than that it was just a, a clean but fairly quiet race um but Lando's was really very much more stop starty but then he just seemed to be a lot more racy from the beginning um but then it, as we said at the very as we said at the very beginning of the podcast it was it, it's 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 verstappen's lack of mistakes that puts him a cut above the rest and we saw that today i just want to know Kyron's thought on oscar slowing down to let lander through for the safety for the safety car period or even slowing down when lander makes the mistake because i'm sure you will have some strong thoughts on teammates doing that yeah, I mean, in general, McLaren were a bit unlucky with the safety car today. I think Norris had a lot of speed early on, but when the safety car came out and everyone else got to make a stop, that just forced McLaren's hand a little bit. And uh, Norris really struggled on tire warm up in that final when he came out that final stop when he came out ahead of Verstappen and then was immediately passed by Max and Russell after that. So. Not sure what that's all about. I mean, he seems to struggle more than most with the entire warm-up there. With Piastri, it was odd. It almost felt like he knew he wasn't as quick as Lando. I mean, at one point, they even asked Piastri, do you, do you think you can challenge Max? And he's like, well, I have my hands full already with the cars behind me. So I think he was realistic about what his overall competitive and what his overall performance was this weekend. And I don't know. I, I think he probably... You know, he's, uh, he's still got a little bit of room for improvement, but I don't have a problem with him letting Lando through there because Lando just looked like a quicker mm -hmm. driver. He probably knows that Lando would be all over the back of his gearbox and he'd have to let him through anyways. So I didn't read too much into that. Um, I was just a little bit disappointed in Norris and Russell because they just made some weird errors uh, a piece. And um, first, Lando coming out of the pits and looking like he was in the route, like competing in Rally Finland for half a lap. It was just odd. Like, and Then Russell got the job done, and um, all he had to do was keep it on track, and then Russell goes off the circuit uh, at the chicane and makes a mess out of it. So you've got to say that uh, you know it was all going on behind these drivers, and these drivers really were making errors. There's no other explanation for this. It's not that you can only blame the track conditions. You know, Max was pretty flawless after the initial excursion he had. So uh, I would not give Lando a driver of the day because while he had an amazing first part of the race, he made some key errors later on that were not what you expect from someone who wants to beat Max Verstappen. So, um, yeah, I'd leave it at that. He was quicker than Piastri, um, but... I feel like this was another missed opportunity for McLaren. I really do. And I've said that a few times this year. I think they have an absolute rocket ship of a car. And they have two very good drivers. But sometimes there's something missing there. Where instead of finishing third, maybe they could have won the race. And I think today was one of those days. And there have also been some other weekends where I felt that way. So a good result. A good drive from both drivers, but certainly not the best on the day, in my opinion, um, with Norris slightly better than Piastri. Yeah, I think McLaren was with so much more, just the, the best package during the race today. But also, what, what did you guys think of this this crucial moment in the race when Russell and Verstappen pit and Norris decided to do, was it two or three more laps? I think two more laps. Two more tight laps and he pits on the third one. I feel like if he 
it was a good choice to do that one more lap because he was two seconds faster. But, but I feel like the second lap is when the issue came because during that second lap, we see Gasly post the fastest lap, which means that the, the crossover period had happened. So do you think that if he just pits a lap earlier, then it's as simple as he wins the race then? Because he, he would have probably come out in front and Max had nothing um, to compete at that point. I, I think the lap that he came into pit, I think he was still fastest. So that was okay. The problem was, but, was but the... that was the lap where um, the mediums start closing up. So that, what I mean is that's not when the gap, the performance gap was the best. I think the bigger problem, because of the rather odd pit exit this thing it has, is that even though he had still an advantage and he, his, I think his in-lap was still faster than them, um, because you have to basically crawl along the pit lane because the pit lane was still soaking wet and then it's got that curved exit, that was what really did it. It was so marginal, and then he was sliding a lot on the exit, trying to get it up. But I guess even if you come out ahead, the tyres... Four seconds down after sector one. He, he yeah. came out next to Max, then he was four, four seconds down by sector one. Yeah, because the tyres just weren't switching on. It was a difficult one. I mean, I was kind of sceptical about him staying on out that long. And then we saw that, like, Lewis, when he pitted, he pitted first. And he had been, I think, right behind Piastri. And then he came out, and he was, like, 11 seconds behind after Piastri pitted or something. So he ended up losing a lot of time. And I think it was just because because it was still a wet track predominantly, the tyres were just not switching on very well. That's exactly. It comes back to Pirelli. I mean, tyre warm-up was a nightmare on the medium tyre uh, when they put the slicks on. So I think wherever he had pitted within that window, one, two laps, he would have still struggled like crazy because Max would have had his tyres up to temperature. So... That was the difference. Like he was, he looked like he was in Rally Finland. Like he was just like sliding all over the place. And um, I think he overdid it. I mean, it really, I, I don't think it should have been that much. I don't think he should have had that much difficulty. But unfortunately, that's what it came down to was, you know, the fact that his tires were cold and Max's were not. So I think unless Norris could have found a way to immediately switch on his tires the moment he leaves the pit lane. I don't think he could have kept Max behind whenever he would have pitted. Because like you both said, Max was miles ahead by the end of the first sector. So I, I don't I don't think it actually would have made a difference, in my opinion, Nav. But uh, I'll leave that open to discussion. That, that's a good point, because if I if I do recall correctly, there were, there were like four seconds by sector one. So you do have a point that the move would have happened anyway, just a few times later. If this was a 2006 grooved Michelin tire, he wouldn't have had that issue. Because this is what I'm getting at. It's like, Pirelli love making tires that are just so hard to switch on. And this was a classic example of that, that McLaren even underestimated how badly the tire reacted to being underheated. And some people like that because they say, oh, look, it gave us action. I just find it annoying. Like. I just want to see the racing. I, I, I want to see them race without them having to worry about tire warm up. I mean, I don't know. It just it feels a bit odd to say that, oh, yeah, Lando lost the race because he couldn't heat up his tires. Like, well, that's a bit odd to me, but that's that's how racing goes these days. And um, it's just something for the teams to keep in mind going forward. I mean, even if you have a gap on exit, if you if you don't have your tires like heated up on a drying track, you're, you're still vulnerable. You're still going to lose out. So credit to Max, credit to Red Bull. They, they played it better. But uh, I think Norris may, have, may, well, may well have had the quicker car in the race. So it's just, it's frustrating for McLaren fans, I bet. I was certain that Norris would win at several points in the race. But let's not forget the, the other contenders who are actually the, the fastest car on Friday and seemed like the fastest car on Saturday. Mercedes, who, well, they leave the, the weekend with the P3 and P4, maybe even P4 and P... No, yeah, if Russell gets penalised, um, well, Lewis will get the, the thing anyway. So they will probably leave with a podium, but definitely not the spot they would have wanted or even expected. Yeah, it's it's a weird one because Russell gets pole position, good job from him. Lewis complained a lot after qualifying, and he complained on several broadcasts. He, he did it on Sky, on Canal Plus, on uh, Viaplay. Um, he, he did it 
everywhere and he seemed completely distraught about the entire weekend he he said he just wanted to go home in like four different uh on like four different broadcasts uh, thanks peter for all this uh, funny headset moment for me um but yeah today he was good he was good apart from like being stuck behind his uh good old driver Al alonso which was honestly hilarious as an alonso fan he took he couldn't get past for 25 laps and of course it's raining so it's harder to get past in rain but him getting stuck for 25 laps between a car that, behind a car that's that was lapping like more than a second slower than the front runners was must have been frustrating and he was saved by sergeant causing a safety car but then lewis goes on hard at the very end of the race and it did seem for a while like it could have been a masterclass where the mediums could have gone off, but it was like last year where, you know, Alonso and Hamilton had hearts on and they were waiting for Verstappen's mediums to go off and it never did. So maybe they just they should they should just understand that mediums in Canada work. Yeah, um, I have one thing to say on Lewis here quickly. Uh, he had a really strong finish to this race um, on the medium tires. He really came through well, but. He only has himself to blame with that qualifying lap. If he had qualified better, he would definitely have been on the podium, in my opinion, because he had magnificent speed in Even clear... better. He had yeah. the same pace as, as uh, Norris and Verstappen during the entire race. So if you discount the 25 laps where he was stuck behind Alonso, he had, yeah, race-winning pace, basically. He really did, and that's got to hurt him because... You know, and I'm sure he's mature enough to realize that, yes, he lost a podium to his teammate, and his teammate really put a classic move on him there. That, 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 that can't go down well, I'm sure, in the debrief. But I think Lewis is now mature enough to see the big picture and realize, look, he was garbage in qualifying. Like you said, he had maybe the quickest car, or one of the two quickest cars on the track, he, and he qualified seventh. All he had to do was qualify higher up, and he would have avoided being blocked by Alonso for so many laps. He wouldn't have put himself in a position to even be racing Russell in the first place. So um, Lewis still has the speed. He just, um, he's making a little bit, too, his qualifying has been a bit shocking in a bad way this year. So he needs to clean that up, but the pace is there. I mean, this weekend, Lewis was very self-critical and there were a lot of people online criticizing his driving. I'm almost compelled to come to his defense. Um, in, in so in practice they were they seem to be really on it fp3 everyone was amazed they were like more than half a second ahead and they're like they must have just done a dry like a low fuel run or something and then in qualifying they were consistently faster for whatever reason everyone's well, almost everyone slowed down in q3 because um the the famous identical pole time um uh russell's q2 lap was a quarter of a second faster and it's like okay yes hamilton was seventh when he could have been on the front row, but how often do we see the top seven being separated by less than a quarter of a second? It's like there was honestly so, so little in it. Maybe it was just a small mistake on his part, or it's um, some people, are, I mean, I, th I think maybe it's just, maybe it's age, or again, it's the psychological aspect because he's not the team leader anymore. He's the outgoing driver. And so some people are trying to say, oh, well, they're sabotaging his car. And it's like, I think it's more than probably naturally just prioritizing um, they're prioritizing George and the status quo in the team has has changed because of that um, but in the race it could it, at first it was like okay fair enough he's just stuck with Alonso and it was only afterwards I realized actually how much pace was being lost once he got past him um, he did make a couple of he had a couple of offs I think there were some big ones that we didn't see because there were points where he'd lose like four or five seconds in one lap or something um, but yeah, suddenly very good at the end. And I was a little puzzled that they were saying, oh, the mediums are going to wear off and the hards will come in. I'm like, not, not at a circuit like this. This is a very low tire wear circuit. And we're talking about running like 10 lap stints on these things. They're not going to wear off. That's enough that you can run both of them really hard. Um, and yeah, got passed by George at the end. Couldn't pass him on the last lap because George also had DRS from Lando. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't terrible. It was what we've seen actually quite a lot in the past two years is that he has the pace to win. It's just that he doesn't have everything falling into place, which is what he's often been very dependent on. Um, and fortunately for me, he, he thinks it's one of his worst races. Uh, for me, it's not, it's not bad enough that it would force me to make some last minute edits on a video, which is already scheduled to come out not long after this one on my channel, at least. Yeah. Look, Lewis was fast in the race. I agree with you. And this was a super tight qualifying. But, you know, this is a man who's paid 
you know, the equivalent of like the per GDP capita of some countries. And he is a seven time world champion with the most pole, pole positions of all time. You really expect him to be if, if the the feet of the top five are, are spread out by half a tenth, you expect Lewis to be in that half a tenth spread. So I don't give him the excuse of that. Um, although everything you said was incredibly rational and valid. He's Lewis Hamilton. He's Sir Lewis Hamilton. So you want to be regarded as this elite driver and be given the big bucks and 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 regarded the way you are, you have to perform pretty much every weekend with no excuses. And there's no he did not perform in qual seventh position in a Mercedes Benz this weekend. He's a joke, in my opinion. He's a total joke and he knows it. And I think that's probably why he's taking a bit more of a mature approach, even though Russell put one on him at the end of the race, he knows if he had just qualified next to Russell, he would have easily beaten Russell. He, he was much better in the race. So anyways, I mean, you're right. I mean, I don't think we need to be overly critical of him. He, he did drive well and, and he is still a mega driver. So at least people know he still has the speed. He just needs to, like you said, Peter, he just needs to put it together um, a little bit more and He's still he's still there um but you know whereas mercedes seemed to have two drivers that work together uh decently well after the race uh i think alpine is something i just want to touch on because um I, i'm just reading right now that there were actually team orders at the end of the race between the two alpine drivers well, well just before just before we go into alpine actually i just wanted to say last thing on mercedes Oh yeah, go ahead. Why did they not put softs at the end for the, for those ten laps? Lewis asked for softs like three times to Bono, and Bono said no, it's too risky. Again, what is risk? You have two drivers. You're not. You, you haven't gotten a. Is, do, do they not have a podium? It, it's a, it's it's, a, it's no. This is their first podium today. But yeah, it's funny. Are. Everyone seems to have decided. Oh, you can't use softs in races anymore. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know yeah. if they even, I don't know if they, the thing is, I don't know if they even test them much in practice to see how long they go. They just assume, oh, it's the quality tire. And it's like, I think you can handle if 10, you've got laps. 10 laps. If you've got 10 laps at the end of a race like this, and you've got two drivers who are in this perfect position where they're between P3 and P5, so that, that's exactly, and they're far ahead of P6. So even if the softs fall off, they're going to finish ahead of Alonso for sure. Okay. Why are they not putting one of the two drivers on this? I mean, the, the, yeah, the, the, they're fast enough that you could make some moves at the start and then even just defend your position if the tires go off because it's only for 10 laps. Especially if the driver is up before. It's not just strategy. Lewis wanted it and he said no. And I think that Lewis will feel a bit hard done by it because... So yeah, my my question to you, Nav, my question to you on that is, let's say he had put on the softs, right? Where do you think he could have finished? And this will lead to my follow-on question. Judging his speed on the mediums, like where do you think he could have finished on the softs? Do you think he could have won the race? Do you think he would have been on the podium ahead of Russell? Where do you think, like guessing, do you think he could have finished if the softs worked as anticipated? So at least B3 because he will get past Russell and then because it will probably be on pure pace, they will not have to switch the cars again. And because we have no idea on the degradation of softs in races anymore, we can't really know. I, I tend to think he could have gotten P2 because he was that fast and he was really impressively fast at the end. I don't think he would have won because... But, that, but that's the thing. We don't know how how long soft slots. Anyway, what, what's the follow-up question? So I, I totally agree with you. I don't think he could have won. I think the most he could have done is beat Russell. And if I'm Mercedes and I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on and my outgoing driver everyone says like carried the team there's still questions around george do i really want this outgoing driver and this is just business i don't even think this is that far-fetched or that much of a tinfoil hat take do i really want that beat george russell i don't think so i don't think they will ever give him a strategy unless they thought he could win the race with the softs which i think mercedes did calculations and said that's not going to happen but he might beat george and Toto and the engineering team probably are thinking, well, why do we want that? We don't want him to beat George. We want George to beat Lewis so that our sponsors next year don't feel like they're losing a huge part of the team. This is a very valid like part of F1. We've seen this numerous times with drivers that are on the way out. They won't get the preferential strategy that they would have gotten 
had they been staying at the team. And I think there's a little bit of that too. I, th I really do. I really I think, think there's, a bit of that. there's quite a lot of that. I agree with you. There's quite a lot of that because why would they have told George with three laps to go, you guys are racing? They would have never done that if um, Lewis was behind. We're seeing it at Alpine as well. And at the end of the day, this is a dirty part of Formula One, the business. And the teams don't compromise. They don't care what you've done for them in the past. If you're on the way out and they think that you beating their driver for next year is going to hurt the team's image, they're not going to let you beat that team. They're not going to let you beat that driver. We've seen this with Raikkonen and Grosjean. We've seen it with Alonso and Alcon. And now we're starting to see it with Alcon and Gasly. And we'll get to that in a second because there have been some radio messages that I've just read about that Alpine duel in the race. They're fascinating to me. But Lewis has got to be prepared for this. And, um, you know, this is how they treat outgoing drivers in Formula One, no matter how much they contributed to a team. So it's an interesting point you brought up, Nav. And I think there's been a little bit of favoritism there, in my opinion, as well. I really do. I mean, another thing to factor in is the fact that Lou, uh, George is ahead in the championship. So regard if, if they finish, regardless of which way around they finish third or fourth, the team still gets the same amount of points. But it's like, OK, let's give the driver in front more points or the opportunity to have more points because it allows them to catch whoever's ahead of them. In this case, it's Piastri. It's that, it's that sort of thinking that in basically everything, any strategy call, you would have given George priority because he was the one on pole and he was ahead the entire race. So he will always get priority and he is, you know, the nominal team leader, even if probably in their contracts, Lewis is probably still the lead driver, but yeah, he's the outgoing driver. Yeah. Uh, frankly, just see, looking at some post race interviews, uh, Lewis said this is, was one of the worst races I've driven. So, yeah, maybe that that could have been a late consideration to an upcoming Peter Brook video. Uh, but yeah, it, it's interesting. He has been very critical, self critical this weekend. Yeah, well, I think he's he's right. I think his, I really think his qualifying is what ruined everything. He just qualified two rows higher, or even two positions higher. I think his race would be completely different. You know, listen, being stuck behind Fernando Alonso for 25 laps is not how you win races. That's like one of the last drivers you want to be stuck behind ever. So, yeah, he only has himself to blame. In a similar way to how Massa never recovered from his crash in Hungary, it was never the same. It seems like Lewis has basically never recovered since Abu Dhabi because he hasn't been the same driver since then. And maybe it's the car or maybe it's just the circumstances, but... It, 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 the way it used to be with him and Bottas is that Bottas was an excellent qualifier but just useless in the races but it was always such marginal gaps in quality and even the same with Nico Rosberg but it was Hamilton was always just able to eke that little bit extra out that could get him pole and could get him ahead and now he can't do that because this year he's qualified seventh for nearly every race like clockwork we're losing he's losing that edge and um and it seems like um, he he's basically just becoming a shell of the Lewis that we saw in like 2018, when he, which is probably when he peaked. Yeah, yeah. He just didn't seem happy with uh, Mercedes at all this this um, weekend, and even at the end of the race, there, there is some uh, some some interesting radio with uh, Toto or lack thereof because he spoke to uh, well, Toto told him what he thought, and Lewis just didn't reply. Well, moving on to, well, the, the transition that Kyron did attempt a few minutes ago, from a driver who was discontent with his team to another. Esteban Ocon is absolutely fuming after this race. I thought there would be some interesting talking points when I saw Gasly overtake Ocon with three laps to go. I thought that that's not going to sit well because that means Gasly overtakes Ocon in the standings. What I didn't know was the team ratios. Esteban did not want that to happen, then asked, would we switch back? And the team said no. And by the end, he had a full on tantrum saying, this is how you thank me. Thank you. Thank you. Like three or four times. And then finally said, I really like working with you two, the two being his engineer. And I think one of his like chief mechanics, implying that the rest of the team and him are completely done now. Now that's really interesting because at the start of the year, and even up to a month ago, Alpine and Alcon seem like they're the most grounded relation, one of the most grounded relationships on the grid right now, because Alcon had, he basically, for me at least, he basically owned um, the Enstone Trust by now. He had been there for five years, and he seemed like the main driver. 
and now it's just completely done. It's completely gone. And Fama seems to completely want him out of not just Alpine. Basically, he Fama seems to want him out of Formula One. He absolutely hates the guy. Yeah, I yeah. mean, um, yeah, I mean, Alpine. They seem to have taken over from Haas as our sort of like prime time soap opera in Formula One now. Um, it was. Uh, we, I mean, going into this race again, we've had the news that they're not keeping Ocon next year. Um, which came out of the out of Monaco that he they, they were trying to pretend that Monaco had nothing to do with in the interviews is like oh we just decided to part ways and it's like yeah let's pretend that you triggering a first lap crash at Monaco and then your team principal coming out against you with a level of candor and honesty in the French media that it seems that only Jacques Villeneuve is capable of in the British media about what he thinks of you and then Jack Doohan getting time in FP1 even if it meant he only got like two laps or something um, let's just pretend that's got just nothing to do. Jack Dewan getting his FP1 appearance in a completely nullified session is one of the funniest things I've seen because it was hyped so much during the entire week. And then he gets, he does one out lap, goes in again, then does one final lap just to get the car back in. Yeah. So... The... Go ahead, Peter. I said, this just reinforces my views about the lack of testing because the driver in his position is supposed to be doing like Pedro de la Rosa levels of mileage, but instead he's done two laps in one weekend. And I imagine if he gets the seat next year, he's probably not going to drive a, a modern car until preseason well, testing. That still year. registers as an FP1 session, right? Like a young driver session. Uh, I think he's done one. He's done them. He did one last year. I think it seemed, it seemed like half the F2 grid did, did Abu Dhabi last year only because it was the last race and they contractually obliged. Yeah, this one counts as one of the six, or is it two or six, um, like rookie sessions? Behrman, yeah, Behrman's doing five. six. Um, he's doing a few. So that, I guess this counts. We've seen it like Paso Award did one and the engine died as he left the pit lane. It's like, great, that's, that's your chance gone. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's just it seemed like it's it's obvious because the, it, there was the speculation that he might even replace him this weekend, and it's like that's a bit soon unless things are really really extreme extreme with the situation. Uh, but yeah, it seems like he's the one getting set up. Obviously, there's rumors of Mick Schumacher. You mentioned Kush Miney is a bit of a curveball. Um, Victor Martins is is making is making things as hard for himself as possible at the moment. So it's probably not going to be him. Um, so it's it looks like he'll be the one replacing Ocon. But it's just funny because the situation is so desperately dire. When Ocon has been there for a long time, he's given them a win. And maybe the only issue is because I know at the beginning of the year, he was still gloating almost about his connections to Mercedes. Um, and yeah. so maybe he's still thinking. But that now he's in the position, if he does go to Mercedes, all he's doing is keeping the seat warm for Andrea Kimi Liuzzi, assuming he gets himself out of this F2 <laughs> bind and makes it to F1. Um, we'll have to see. Yeah. No, well said. Well said. Look, I think you just touched on something there. There's no doubt Monaco was the catalyst for, you know, the Jack Dewan having a run in free practice. And, but it was, it, that, that was not the single event. I really do believe Alcon bragging at the, and I did a community post on this on my channel, but Alcon bragging at the team launch about his ties to Mercedes in front of Renault's and Alpine's management was a stupid chess move. You know what I mean? And that apparently enraged a lot of people in Alpine and Renault to the point that they decided we don't want two French drivers anyways. And they were thinking of getting rid of one of these two. And they've decided that it was going to be Ocon right from that moment. And Esteban, by not adhering to team orders that were given before the start of the race in Monaco, gave him a perfect opportunity to expedite his departure or the announcement of his departure. And it's unfair to me because Esteban has been stronger than Gasly, in my opinion, this year. If you just read his post, like, now I've read some of it, but, like, if you read the comments that he made after the race was over, I mean, they're brutal. I mean, he says, no comment. I'm too nice, too nice. I've done what I had to do, which is the most important, but you guys didn't do what you had to do. That's it. Basically, and again, again, was, again on Gunnar, yeah. Chris, he said... Uh, I did my job, not the team again um, in French, obviously. So, yeah, uh, it's he yeah. is really, really annoyed. Yeah, and that's horrible management by Alpine because if you told Esteban last week to follow a team order and he didn't, um, that's fine. But then if you told Esteban that he has to let Gasly pass and then you don't switch them around at the end of the race if Ocon was faster and Gasly couldn't make places, that that isn't helping Ocon's mindset that you know he's not being treated fairly, which I'm sure he thinks. 
And that's going to cause some serious issues because Esteban Ocon is not the type of driver to just go away quietly. Remember, him and Gasly have bad blood going back to their childhood. This is very personal for Ocon. This is more than just another teammate. This is someone who he's had basically childhood trauma with uh, and childhood beef with, for lack of a better term. And he has a lot of pride. He came from nothing. And there's no way he's going to accept something like this. The next time him and Gasly are wheel to wheel, I think I'm going to turn away from the TV because I think something's going to happen. And I can say that Bruno Famin, maybe he thinks he knows what he's doing. This is not the correct way to manage your drivers and not the right way to manage a personality like Esteban Ocon. It's going to cause big problems unless they drop Ocon for the next races because you can see Esteban feels like he's being targeted. And when someone feels like they're being targeted, that's when they're dangerous. That's when they lash out. That's when they act in unpredictable and desperate ways, especially someone as hot-headed as Esteban. So, yeah, this team is providing us the soap operas these days. And uh, I have a feeling like we haven't even seen the best of it yet. I think there's still more drama to come between these three, Dazzly, Ocon, and Famen. And I just hope uh, Esteban finds a, a drive for next year because he is a good driver and despite all the online abuse that he faces, he's nowhere near bad enough to be considered, uh, you know, as someone who should lose his seat when we've we've got at least seven or eight other drivers that uh, that can't hold the candle to him, frankly. So we'll see how it all ends, but uh, it's a mess over at uh, at Alpine, that's for sure. I fully agree because one of the best ways to measure, well, you just talk about the online abuse he got. The reason Alonso Ultras were so nasty to him, and I say that as an Alonso fan, is they felt threatened because Ocon was faster than they thought. They thought that Alonso would come in and completely demolish Ocon, and he didn't. And I still think, look, 2022, I don't care, Alonso was faster or whatever, but Ocon was so close to him, and in quality was matching, if not um, outpacing him. So Ocon is a very good driver, and the, the reason he was targeted so badly by Spanish fans is, or the, the Spanish toxic fans is, he he was threatening their idol. Secondly, if there's one thing uh, Draft Survive Season 6 showed me, is that Fama is, uh, he, he's, he doesn't come from a background of management or whatever. I think he's a commercial guy who was thrusted in there because Otmar was kicked out. So they just put in another guy who they knew. Um, and he even says a few times in the show, Again, that I feel like season six did show us some behind the scenes stuff that we did want to see. Horner is just wondering who is that guy. Like he meets Fama and he's like, I've never seen you. Um, and I think Basser also meets Fama and he's like, I don't think I've seen you before. So, so this is not a guy who's used to these points. And third point is, Ocon, honestly, and that's something the producer Ocon uh, pointed out, he should just, he could just leave Alpine and just join Williams and replace Sargent. I would rather see him at Williams at the moment. Well, James Wells doesn't want him there, but I would rather see... Ocon at Williams, if that was a possibility. And, you know, they, Alpine can just promote their junior because we have, what, 12 races to go? 12, 13, 15? 15 races to go, actually, I think. Um, God knows. A whole season. Ocon and Alpine are... Yeah, so Ocon and Alpine are not going to last. It's going to get really ugly because the, both of those parties, they're, they're not ones to make compromises. They're both very hot-headed and they're going to completely implode. I think in the um, Thursday press conference, it was Gasly. He even said, "Like we're not even pretending to be friends anymore." Like the past yeah. couple of years, yeah. they, they, they all the all, I mean, Alpine. They're, they're one of the teams that they really go all out with those like that social media tat that all the teams do, where they play those little games and stuff with the drivers, trying to make them look like besties or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm just enjoying the drama because we could use some of this, particularly now that Haas have decided to become half competent since they lost Gunter. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day. I don't have much allegiance to either driver. I'm not really that bothered. I mean, they're just they're just two more mid Frenchmen in this long noble lineage of mid Frenchmen that we've had since the mid 1970s, except for Prost, basically. Um, and it's like, okay, so if they stay or go, I don't really mind. But if they're going to give us some something to gossip about and have some shouting matches, that's always entertaining. It's just also funny because it seems like Alpine are doing whatever they can to ruin what is becoming quite a good year for them. When you think that at the beginning of the year, they were noticeably behind and they finished 17th and 18th and they just got a double points finish. And they've now overtaken um, Williams. 
in so they're now they're up to eighth in the constructors they're only a couple more points behind from Haas um so I mean they're still you know miles off where they were last year but they're 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 moving up and it's and considering how the season started it's it's going reasonably well yeah no doubt about that they've improved it's still not a great car I mean that thing was well in the midfield today but it's massively improved from the start of the season so who knows you know they if they keep improving it they could surprise people by the end of the year but not if their drivers are at each other's throats and everyone hates each other and uh Alcon feels like it's him when Alcon feels like it's him versus the world that's when bad things start to happen and I think he thinks that right now so yeah I, I think Bruno Famine is giving us all a clinic on how not to manage drivers frankly um he's really showing that he has he doesn't have a clue you know he's publicly humiliated one of his drivers now twice so you know there's a reason why nobody's ever seen him before but um you know we'll see how that we'll see how that goes my my i don't have a i'll finish off by saying this i don't have a dog in that fight necessarily i just feel like esteban Ocon is the last of a breed of drivers who came from nothing Okay, this is not somebody who paid his way into Formula One. He had to win. He came from a poor background, and he got to F1 on merit. Um, that doesn't mean he deserves to stay just because of that. But if I had to pick between Ocon and Gasly, I like Ocon better because I think Ocon has a more interesting story, and I think Ocon gives us better racing. I mean, who can forget the duel he had with Fernando Alonso in Miami? It was amazing. When have you ever seen Gasly ever duel anybody like that? I mean, Gasly is just so mid. It's just everything he does is mid. At least Ocon has these peaks where you say, wow, you know, this guy really took it to somebody. That's all I'll say on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, Gasly got scalped by Max, but Ocon at least managed to square up to Nando when he was his teammate. Exactly. Exactly. One really funny thing I saw was Alpine's post about P9 and P10 reads, double points finish in Canada, huge team effort. Just just throw the soleil over there and didn't didn't um, they fire someone else this week or someone else has left? They've lost another engineer or another another head of strategy or whatever it is. I don't know. I'm sure someone uh, else left a couple of days before they announced that Ocon was going to leave at the end of the year. Someone else, another another team member is gone. Well, that that wouldn't surprise me. But last thing on Ocon, yeah, he he made a position to yeah. Think, Sorry, interrupting now. Keep going. No, he, he made eight positions today, and most of it fairly, um, mostly by staying out um, when the safety car happened. So he didn't pit again for the second safety car period. So that's how him and Tsunoda were the only ones to stay out. And, you know, Tsunoda couldn't manage, whereas Ocon did. So it it was a brilliant race from him, and getting told to swap with Gasly for seemingly no reason. That that's not how you treat someone who had made up of the grid, and also pretty much was one of the what three four drivers who didn't make a mistake this race. I don't think he made a single mistake this race. So yeah, it, it's all quite uh, unfair on him. Um, I mentioned sooner that I think that there's oh, go on, Karen. One quick thing on Alpine, I want to say. Um... And to your point, Nav, uh, Alcon extended his uh, interstint. Uh, yes. I think it was his interstint by a huge margin, too, so he has to get credit for that. But I want to just quickly touch on the firing that Alpine made. This is very interesting that was brought up earlier. So they fired Rob White. They fired him. And Rob was a huge part of the championship winning teams. He's the operations director. So... What's the significance of this? Well, actually, this is very significant because this is basically um, a continuation of firing Alan Permain, Otmar Saffenhauer, a bunch of the engineers. Uh, you know, Pat Fry left, um, Matt Harmon, Dirk De Beer. So this is part of Bruno Famine's new vision. And if we haven't spoken about this, we should now. He wants to go to three technical directors, one for aero, one for performance and engineering, like McLaren have done. He's basically trying to copy what McLaren did and transplant that into 
the Alpine system. So it's interesting because Alpine think clearly they can do what McLaren did, but uh, that's, you know, it just, it, it's interesting to see how they're doing this. They're letting go of all these experienced people with great pedigrees. Um, you, you wonder who they're going to even lean on going forward, but uh, that is a significant firing um, that was brought up earlier. So it's just interesting to note that. It's kind of insane to me that this, this used to be Flavio Briatore's team. I mean, the man was a psychopath, but he knew what he was doing. Like, mm -hmm. it's just such, yeah. It's, I mean, this is one of the ones that's been through like 10 trillion different iterations. It's not, it's not really Alpine, it's just Team Endstone. Uh, and the way it's going, I mean, maybe in a couple of years, they'll, someone else will buy them and they'll have a new brand name attached to them. I don't know. Yeah. Like, who's left there? Everyone's gone. I mean, Bob Bell, Matt Harmon, Pat Fry, Dirk DeBeer, Alan Permain, Rob White. Um, they must have some incredible young junior talent or they're poaching somebody because it's just Prost odd. That... Prost at least had the foresight to jump instead of getting pushed. People right. probably see it was a mess. He's like, no, nah, I'm gone. Don't need this anymore. Yeah. Just on that, people said, oh, yeah, that means that Prost isn't committed to helping out a French team or that means that he was trying to impose himself. When a lot of people just also understood that means Prost doesn't trust the system. Like, he got criticized for it because people were defending Alpine, but now it's so obvious that he wasn't buying into any of it. And honestly, even when they appointed Otmar and they fired Bukowski, yeah, I didn't know who Bukowski was, but he, he was doing a fine job. He was managing Alpine uh, well. Ocon and Alonso didn't have fights back then. Alonso got a podium with him. They got a win with him. Um, I've got no idea where he went, and I've got no idea where he came from, because I had never heard of him. But even that, I was like, why are you getting rid of him? He, he was a sound guy, so yeah. It's the same Cyril Abitable, he got fired out of nowhere as well, and quite unexpectedly. And I think Ricardo leaving yeah. messed things up as well, for, well, for him mostly, and I think that took away a lot of his sort of credibility, that his, his, his golden boy had gone, and they're like, okay, it's time for you to go too. But yeah, they've gone through so many TPs and so many iterations, I really forget who was who, who, who was there when. But, Peter, you mentioned Flavio Briatore. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a rumor that Flavio is returning to Alpine, to Endstone? He's been seen around but, the paddock, hasn't he? Not as a team principal, but as a main advisor. So similar to what Patrick Head maybe still is doing or was doing very recently with Williams where he came back as like a consultant advisor type thing. Um, yes. Maybe that's what it is. Because I, I, I guess the sort of statute of limitations, if you will, on spite on the crash gate has expired now for him and he's allowed to come back into the fold because um, uh, Pat Simmons was allowed to come in, back, was allowed to rejoin the grid much, the paddock a lot sooner than he was. Um, for 16 years, I guess he's allowed to. Good grief. Can you imagine Bria Torre, Pat Simmons back in a team and then Fernando Alonso goes and joins that team? I mean, I, I, it's just, it, it's too, it's too horrible to think about, but they're all very good at what they do. It's just, I can't believe Flavio is even allowed to be involved. I would love it because he's, he's somebody from a bygone age, though. It's like having, I mean, Ross Braun is still involved with the FIA, but having him back or Jean Todd or anyone from that era bringing them back in, because I mean, o o Alonso is now the only link to that because he just passed, he just broke the record for longest interval between first and last point scoring, points finishing positions or something, uh, 21 years or whatever. Yeah. But the problem is, is that Fabio's a cheater. So it's just, I, I suppose they're all cheaters in Formula One in a way, but, you know, I just wonder, like, do you, like, does Flavio have something to do with the people leaving? I mean, Probably not, but it's interesting that Bruno Famine thinks that Flavio Briatore is worth bringing on. Um, you know, I don't know what they're planning at Alpine, but clearly it's something big. It's just very unclear what on earth that is. That, um, the start of the new 100 race plan that's going to start in 26 when the new regulations are announced. Yeah. So, I found that interesting. Anyways. Well, yeah, um, all from Flavio's nonsense, let's talk about his protégé then. Alonso and Aston Martin, they, they had a, a, a better weekend, for sure. Um, I think they, they had a weekend that they really needed uh, this year because it had been a few races where they were nowhere, it was stagnating, um, everyone was a bit concerned. And yeah, getting both cars into Q3 was good. 
um, the core seem, Alonso said the core is better, but they need to understand it more, which is good. And in the race, they just drove, they didn't drive, drive brilliantly, they just drove P6 and P7. Um, I, my personal thoughts are, they were nowhere near the top three, so I don't mind the, the slower pace, because I, I think they, they just manage the races, maybe try to get some data in. But I just think they, they needed a weekend like this, um, so that's nice from them. Yeah, I mean, um, I think you could almost say they had the best weekend of any team because they didn't have yeah. in the race. Yeah. N- n- neither driver made any mistakes. I mean, we saw we saw basically nothing from Lance. We saw Alonso a lot because Hamilton was stuck behind him for a long time. Um, Alonso made Alonso... a mistake. He had to cut the. I mean, that, that oh first yeah, yeah, he didn't. He yeah. nearly hit the wall. Of returning. Yes. Didn't he? But other than yeah. that, yeah, it was a very good. I mean, yeah, sixth and seventh in a car that obviously wasn't fast enough to challenge the front runners. Um, but then they were just, it was so that from a damage limitation perspective, they did everything they needed to do, capitalized on a weekend when Ferrari was slow and the people behind them were having their own bubbles and problems. So, yeah, for them, not, not, a, not a bad showing. Can't fault either driver, can you? I think they maximize their car. Alonso makes me wonder, though, after, he, after qualifying, he's like, yeah, I think I could have gotten pole if uh, the setup was better. I mean, what does that mean? Does that mean that you underperformed? Does that mean that you can't set up a car? Does that mean you're just saying that to boost the morale of your team? A little unclear to me because it seemed like they they definitely improved this weekend from past weekends. But if we think Alonso had a car for pole and he finished sixth, then that's a disaster. I don't think he had the quickest car by any means. I think he, I think he finished where the car should finish, and Lance did a similarly decent job. So. Uh, I think he's yeah. doing it for sponsors because mm. he, he's done. He's said that a lot of times, and you know, having watched his lap, there's one mistake where he loses a tenth. I don't think there's more than that, but I really do feel he says that for sponsors because, he, for some reason, since he has joined Aston Martin, he thinks a lot about sponsors. And he, when he was stripped from his Jeddah podium last year, his first reaction was, "Well, all the sponsors were shown on TV, so I don't care." I got my proposition, I got third, I don't care about whether it's my 101st or 102nd. Um, so yeah, I, I know he made that comment, I think it's mostly just to boost morale, because if if the car was, um, if the car had potential for pull, I think we all know that he would have been closer, especially if his lap didn't have a big mistake. Yeah, I mean, they're now in the position that Alpine were last year. That then they're not they're not where they were at the beginning of last year definitely and um then they've just drifted into that midfield by themselves because they didn't have yeah noticeably far behind the front runners and again ahead of the people behind them weren't really that that close to them um but yeah yeah it's it's funny you're saying oh the setup needs to be better or if it's, it's like just saying oh if i was faster i'd be on pole so yeah we okay. yes. yeah 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 that, that, yeah that's just, why i wasn't i didn't agree with people saying well, that means there was potential. Well, well, no, that, that's like saying that's what that, that's like when drivers say, are saying, "If I was at my peak, I could have done it." Well, you're you're not so it's an issue for me at least. Mm. But what I will say is, I was I was a bit shocked by Lewis not getting past Alonso for twenty five laps. Um, yes, he was in wet conditions, but surely Lewis should have made that move. I don't know that that's. I was a bit surprised by that. I mean, it's experience from both of them. They're the two most experienced drivers on the grid, and then they know each other. Is that Lewis probably wouldn't have taken unnecessary risks, but also Alonso knows how to position his car. Like we've seen, what a good defensive driver he is. So it's like, yeah, just kind yeah. Of and Lance, I think, from both of them. And, and Lance, I think, also did exactly what he needed to do: a clean race with even less issues. I think than Alonso. I don't think he had any um, offs. That there was one small missed breaking point, but. That's why I feel like Aston needed this. Both drivers just had to chill, compose B6 and B7, and then we'll see where they are next week. But but Lance really needed that, and it's, it's nice to see him deliver in his home race, even though no one, he doesn't seem to have a lot of fans at home, but it's good for him, I guess. And also, apparently, um, my crack all but confirmed he is in the seat next year. So even though there were some doubts, uh, Mike has said, yeah, that's the plan. And it's going to get signed and announced very soon. Look, guys, I am always honest. And 
I always say things because I believe they're true, right? I think in life, we should look at the truth and follow that. And based on everything this we've all said. The quote is taken from Jacques Villeneuve. Yeah, so my, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Because something you just said triggered something in me in that, like, Fernando Alonso is from the old school era. He's from the era where they went racing when it was monsoons and he didn't put a foot wrong today. And it makes me think, what if Alonso was in a Red Bull? What if Alonso was in a McLaren? Do you really think he would have given up that position to Max Verstappen the way Norris did? And I know there's been a lot of talk of like, oh, Alonso's been messing up quality and Hamilton's dropping off. I still believe that Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton are the two main challengers to Max Verstappen on talent in this sport. I still believe that. Until I see different, I don't, I don't want to hear it. And at this point, races like this, where all the young drivers were trying to imitate, you know, like Beyblades or like some kind of a, you know, spinning performance. It was, it was just, it's just, sorry, that's my uh, childhood reference to a silly show. But <laughs> my, my point is, is that Fernando and Lewis actually, I think, showed their class in the race. Lewis needs to sharpen up in qualifying. But it's frustrating because I really think we would have even had, I think we could have even better races if, you know, Aston can pick up their pace. And I don't know what's happened to Aston, but as a neutral, right, as somebody who is not a Fernando Alonso fan, who actually cheered against Alonso for almost my entire life and stressed out about it massively at times as I was a kid, I can objectively tell you that Fernando Alonso needs to be involved in these fights for the win at this point because I have no confidence in anyone challenging Max in a straight fight and really winning if the cars are similar like today. And I just have a feeling that someone as clean as Fernando in the races is exactly the kind of driver that would give Max problems. Because if Max makes one mistake, Fernando will make zero mistakes. And Lewis is also super aggressive. So um this was not a good race for the young generation. Like I, 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 my opinion of them just like kind of went down a little bit today. Like it should be the older veterans that make mistakes as they get older and the younger guys who set a new bar. And anytime we see these challenging races, it's almost like we're reminded that this young generation still has a lot of cracks. And that's my rant over. Um, we can talk about Ricardo if we want, but uh, I, I don't have anything else to add on that. I mean, specifically what I meant is if you want to speak about Ricardo's performance in light of Jack Villeneuve's comments, I thought he bounced back pretty pretty strongly, has to be said. Yeah, um, yeah, actually, yeah, I think that's a good time to talk about the, the V-Cubs. Um, yeah, so Jack Villeneuve became a celebrity again this weekend, it seems, by featuring again on Sky. Look, I'm someone who uses extensively Canal kind of Plus for my F1 coverage. I grew up with them. Uh, for what eight or nine years, had to use Sky when I was surfing around the sea, the, the waves of the internet to find streams when I was studying, but mostly used Canal Plus. And actually, even when when recently Crofty became a bit insufferable, I went back to even when I surfed the waves of the internet, I would go find uh, streams of Canal Plus instead. So I'm used to Jacques Villeneuve saying absolutely outrageous stuff, like not a single thing he said on Friday or Saturday surprised me because there are three drivers he always comes for, even when like, there could literally be a silent moment in, on the stream and he would just attack Stroll. Like there's nothing going on and he would go full on um, Kyron Von way, but on Canal Plus, so not on a podcast. He would just start saying, by the way, Lance Stroll, why is he still on the, why, why is he in this race? What's he doing? When he's just, Lance has maybe just been chilling in P13 and he would do that. So yeah, he's attacked his three favorite victims, Lance, Ricardo, and Kevin Magnussen. But of course, uh, Ricardo is the one who got targeted the most because he's the one who's most topical at the moment. And his fans took it pretty, very badly. And I did not expect that kind of reaction because again, I, I grew up with this. And his fans started looking up every single Villeneuve crush there was, every... Um, incendiary, incendiary um, comment Bill have made, and even the comments he would have made like twenty years ago, when, as Kyron always says, it was a different sport. People said stuff more. So looking up comments Bill said at BAR or 
Williams. It doesn't look good. Okay. So, first of all, I agree with every single word Jack said, and I still do. One race means absolutely nothing. But well done to Daniel. He uh, he showed that he's not totally incompetent. The, the What I want to say is this to all the Ricardo fans who are ripping on Jack Villeneuve. Imagine in your rookie season, or in Daniel Ricardo's rookie season, he went up against Jensen Button in the same team. And let's say Jensen didn't switch teams and stayed at Braun and had familiarity with the car. Do you think Daniel Ricardo would have been able to take Jensen to the final round of the world title as Jack did to Damon? Not a chance. So I don't want to hear it. Jack is more talented than Daniel ever was, even if Jack is one of the weaker world champions overall. And that's all I have to say about that. The disrespect shown to Jack Villeneuve is getting out of hand. People talking about Jack like he was some kind of a scrub. Jack Villeneuve was a mega driver at his peak. A mega driver. Super exciting. Super fast. Yes, he was nowhere near as good as Michael, but he wasn't far off Mika. And at the end of the day, he was firmly behind the top two of that era, but you could easily make an argument he was the third best driver in that generation. And that's all I have to say about it. Show some respect to the 1997 world champion, please. Yeah, I mean, of those three drivers, Ricardo's fans are by far the most defensive because the others, I mean, Stroll has very few and Magnussen's, they just kind of seem to own it. They're like, yeah, he is a bit of a terrorist. Like, that's what makes him fun. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, but we, yeah, with Ricardo, it seems like ever since he left Red Bull, it's just been constant bitching and fights on Twitter to try and justify him being on the grid. Um, and it, 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 what was funny for me, most funny for me is that Sky, they just don't know how to respond to this. Because Natalie Pinkham is like Ricardo's best friend and um, Danica Patrick's always going to try and say the right things and all of that. And it's just that they were like, I don't know how to, they, they would come up with the usual PR responses. Like, oh, well, it's been difficult ever since he had to, he wasn't easy at McLaren in the cars. It's like, just no, this it, it's again, because a couple of days ago, Sunoda got his extension for next year, which is like, okay, well, fair enough, because he can't go to Red Bull at the moment. So I guess he's doing five consecutive years of this alleged junior team alongside somebody who was, a junior at the junior team 11 years ago and then did five did as... that, it justifies all of our what if scenarios where we we sometimes kept drivers at the same place for like six or seven years and it seemed unrealistic but sort of this thing at, at um well Toro Rosso for five years it's made our what if videos make sense now yeah, i mean it would i suppose it's like we have we, we got bottas stuck at williams for nine years or something and then he gets used to by <laughs> george um but it was it's like the thing is, is that any other team, it's like fair enough. But the whole point of this team is that you're meant to be there for two years max, and then you either move up to Red Bull or you go somewhere else. And so Sunoda has been there for too long, and Ricardo should not be there at all. Especially now that now that Checo's locked in for possibly the next two and a half years, there is nowhere for Ricardo to go. And he's openly said, you know, I'm only here because I want to drive for Red Bull again and get beaten by Max again. Um, so for him. Yeah, he should just go. And again, Jack is absolutely right that he's there for commercial reasons. That he's there, but he's there because of Netflix. Um, this is something that you just get the older drive. The drivers of that generation are older. They are just way more honest, and they're not. They don't just feel the need to praise everyone and say everything's amazing. They will call you out if you're not delivering. I mean, he he went after Stroll a little bit, and I was thinking, can you please go there? Because I just love the optics of Canada's only champion going for the only. Canadian driver at the Canadian Grand Prix. That's just exactly what we need right now. And against Magnussen, when Magnussen blocked somebody in practice or said so and so got, oh no, he was talking about, wasn't he talking about the, the crash um, with Checo and saying, oh, he's blaming it on him. And then he's like, well, that's why he never learns. It's like, yeah, we just, we, yes. need, we need this. Yeah. His, his insight is really good. And, uh, and he is definitely one of the weaker champions because post Williams, it was pretty miserable. Like six years, five, six years of BAR really rough three races of Renault and then not brilliant with Sauber, but he really was a monster in those first two years. And he just took, he just came out of nowhere and just like took, took F1 by storm. Yeah. Just to make it clear, Villeneuve, too much of Villeneuve is very annoying. Um, I, I'm not, I don't want to imply that, you know, he's a fun commentator or whatever. He, he really gets on your nerves when you're listening to him for 20 races. And it's insane to say, but Franck Montagny, who has a nothing cover in Formula One, super guru and coke, uh, coke uh, indulger is what we remember him for. And he's infinitely better as a commentator or as an analyst. But Villeneuve saying that, and just that clip of Villeneuve saying it, and then I don't even know who that um, 
interviewer was it's the blonde sky one she rachel rachel brooks she, yes rachel brooks she froze for three seconds because that's how unused she was to a pundit or like a, an analyst saying something that goes against the great she froze for like three or four seconds and then said uh, uh, do you think that means he's uh do you think he's overrated then and i was like so a commentator at sky who's probably one of the most trained you know journalists tv um, tv trained um just broadcasters is hesitating because that's how much sky has been told to to just go with the most um generic narratives nico vosberg is the only one who goes against it and they have to accept it because it's nico vosberg so yeah it was just baffling to me that that's how used people are now to just listening to benign and pacifist stuff i mean jensen sometimes does Br brundle will say it how it is as well he's good at that like again it's the older it's the ex-drivers and the ones from the 90s noughties years are the ones you get this this degree of honesty from we, we need that we absolutely need that the, the commentary team has been the entire sky f1 production has been way too sterile and politically correct for far too long and we it was like a breath of fresh air to have some somebody come in and just say it uh, how it is you know like we're sick and tired of the corporate corporate talk on these programs we want analysis we want opinions and i'll stop by saying this much uh jacques villeneuve has every right to criticize lance stroll even on a personal level this guy was thrown out of his own team's motorhome and banned from the Williams motorhome back in 2017 because he criticized Lance as a rookie. So there's bad blood there. I mean, they, the, the strolls banned Villeneuve from entering the Williams paddock. So, you know, they did it to themselves. I don't know what you would expect a Williams world champion to say if you banned them from their own team. I mean, that's low blow right there. And and the other two, I mean, it's, the thing with Jack is if you don't like the drivers that he's criticizing, you agree with them because I do think Kevin Magnuson doesn't learn. And I do think Daniel Ricardo is only here, as we've all said, for commercial reasons. So people should realize where he's coming from. It's it's part of it is sensationalism and then part of it is honest analysis. And we would much rather that than the usual uh, you know, boring, basically politically correct nonsense that's being spewed about these drivers uh most of the time with Sky. So I really do hope we have more of that as well. Mm um but yeah i think so okay we talked about ricardo a lot sunoda um so he had yeah contract extension he's doing another year with, with rb his race wasn't brilliant in the end i mean in qualifying he he didn't i don't he didn't do a push lap in q3 he was like 1.7 seconds down or something but the race it just wasn't working because he didn't change inters he was one of the ones that stayed long with them like ocon and someone else did too um and then he was in the points and then spins so and finishes 14th or whatever so yeah really not not brilliant from him in the end with me having half defended him this week saying oh he's the one that should have gone to red bull instead of checo yeah that, that was a weird mistake i didn't really get it because he just completely overshot it into the corner and then spun and nearly collected the house that was on Kong. That, that could have been a really nasty crunch hogenberg avoided it by a few centimeters that, that could have been a head zone crush that would have like made it a three or four car pile off so yeah it was a an, an uncharacteristic mistake from him I, i'd say because we, you see him make mistakes in battle sometimes but this one was just weird and also on his extension i'm not too happy with it i would have wanted him to just have a go somewhere i don't think staying at the Rosso for fifth year is the option is the solution maybe that's the only solution he had um, maybe he never got offered anything at Williams or Haas or Alpine. Alpine seems set, Haas seem more than set. Williams as well. They they have Ocon available now. They have science available. So honestly, maybe that was his only option, and that's why he's chosen it. But I think I, he's a driver who is uh, a driver I would have wanted to see somewhere else. Yeah, but you know what's interesting is that he was ahead of Ricardo. Uh, at one point in the race, and when he crashed, he was beating Ricardo. So he had come back from being outqualified and from Daniel's five second penalty because he jumped the start to being ahead. 
But then the pressure was on for the first time in a while because Sonoda really hasn't been racing Ricardo that closely on track. And I really think a lot of drivers today just cracked under pressure. And that was that was what happened to Sonoda, in my opinion. I think he was really being put under pressure by Daniel for the first time in a long time. And he knew he had to, you know, keep it on the road in tricky conditions. And he just showed that he doesn't really have elite level composure. And um you know, it was a bad mistake. There's no other way to put it. And he only has himself to blame. Uh, he's still, geez, I mean, he's still the best driver at that team. But those are mistakes that, you know, you've got to cut out if you ever want to make the move to a top team. But I say that, but he's like Perez in some ways because he's got the backing of all these massive Japanese sponsors, not to mention Japanese manufacturer in Honda. So, you know, he may well be able to get a top seat, even if he drives in a mediocre fashion. So it's um, it's up to it's we'll have to see how that plays out. But um, not his finest weekend, that's for sure. Look, but the one thing about his him being mediocre is he challenges Perez for number of Q3 appearances, which is still unacceptable. Yeah, this is the thing about that, that is that in, in Q1, we saw Checo get knocked out. And then Sunoda went second, so he went exactly where Perez was supposed to be, but in the slower car. Yes, and he and and they're not moving seats. Uh, but just quickly on on Ricardo, because you mentioned, because again, you were saying, "Oh, good race from him," and on Twitter, everyone's saying, "Oh, that was an amazing race." It's like, yeah, but was it really? He qualified fifth. He jumped the start, got a penalty, which he took during a safety car, and still finished eighth. One thing like, on that, that he, he jumped the start. Good. He, he jumped the start and got overtaken by Alonso. No, that's yeah, not <laughs> Because this that's is... Alonso finding traction, as we know, but that's also, how do you jump a start and lose a position? Because he, he jumped the start then messed up his gear shifts, and Alonso was already there, so it was like, oh yeah, mm. so you can cheat, but I'm literally better than you. Well, it's the same, like, um, like, I don't think you got penalised, but uh, Suzuka 2019 Vettel jumped the start, but not, not quite enough to get an advantage, but just enough to mean he had to stop and start again and lose, lost the lead immediately to Bottas. Um, but yeah, it's like, on what planet was this a good race from Ricardo? Because before the race, and again, Sky were questioning Villeneuve, it's like, oh, were you impressed yet? Because after Quali, I think Ricardo was like, oh, eat shit, was his comments to, to Villeneuve. And Villeneuve was like, yeah, no, no, you, Sunday is what matters. I'm still not impressed or whatever. And it was just, it, his honesty he was... He said I'm pretty shocked, which, which I did find really good. Yeah, it just he was saying this, and then they immediately went, Danica, your thoughts? And she was just like, oh, well, you know, he's in a, he's in a difficult position. It's like, oh, whatever. You know, we're not here for you. We're here for Villeneuve. Um, yeah, this yeah. wasn't a good this wasn't a good for race for Ricardo or Sunoda. It was a, kind of a train wreck for both of them, to be honest. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And uh, I, I'm not really sure in what universe a, a jump start gets a five-second penalty. What's that all about? It used, to be, jumped... much, it used to be much stronger, didn't it? Wait, you should be yeah, at least 10 seconds. I think China 2010, Alonso jumped, started, and he got yeah, a drive through. Say, Alonso got a, he got a drive through penalty for that. I think Maldonado got something pretty hefty in uh, 2012 Belgium, but then he did have like two accidents in the first three laps or something. No, that, that's that probably, different. Yeah. He, he stopped a title race with that. That's <laughs> Yeah. Well, it was, it was the combined powers of him and Grosjean put together, like oh, that, that race start. Um. Yeah, but that, that was a really, really lenient penalty, which again, he took into a safety car, so it was really more of like a two-second penalty, like at that, yeah. at that rate. It wasn't, I, 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 I was thinking, is that I didn't know that you were, you were allowed to take penalties under safety cars, because in Formula 2, you're not even supposed to pit if there's a safety car, I don't think, or you're not, they have funny rules there's about... There's a specific rule on when they open the pit lane, um, it's, it's, which yeah, I, it's, it's I'm sure the second car was really annoyed about in Monaco, but yeah. Yeah, it's, th th there are some funny rules in there, um, but that's that's a different topic. Um, yeah, so there's... What like, I found really funny is... Sorry, go on. No, nothing else. Oh, just, uh, I found it really funny because they asked Marco, Helmut Marco, uh, who who was in the running for the um, Alpha Tauri seat. Well, RB, there, there I go. Um, <laughs> for the uh, B-Cop seat. And he mentioned the Iwasa. And I was like, okay, so if he's mentioning Iwasa, that means there's a real chance of Tsunoda leaving. And then a few hours later, they signed to know that. And I'm like, why did you mention Iwasa? There's no way you're having two Japanese drivers. And Iwasa isn't a disgusting driver. He's a decent. If he got a seat for a year or two, it wouldn't be bad. It would be fine for him to get a seat. But why did he say Iwasa if Sunoda is signed? There is no chance of him getting that. So that would be very strange yeah, um, to have 
have a their own like super agru- well it, super Honda agree. engine su- super agree Honda but just you know super yes. towery super towery Honda um yeah, yeah cuz um, it wa- I, I, I says one I kind of because he's doing so super formula I've forgotten about him he was a driver in F2 I always like maybe it's because he's Japanese I was always expecting him to have some gigantic accident with somebody that's completely unnecessary and then just never did I think I've been conditioned you're getting not... cancelled if someone has reached this point of the podcast you get it cancelled because you yeah no, no, I just I think I've, I've been conditioned to expect that because of Sato and Kobayashi and Nakajima and 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 Tsunoda um yeah, and yeah but, but no, he was always like a, a sound driver and um yeah, it's he's not going to make it, but uh, I found it interesting. And the, the second thing is, why? Just what what's going on with Liam Lawson? Because that, that's just a small thing. It's not going to be a full conversation. But apparently, he's been making comments on in the New Zealand press about his treatment and how he deserves a seat and how he's been much better than Ricardo. Like he's been mm-hmm. openly saying that, and Red Bull doesn't like that at all. So we, we might be con- contemplating a future where Lawson completely gets jumped. Like Theo Porsche and never gets a full time seat. So it's, you know, all of a sudden seats are getting filled up and Lawson is, Lawson is not a guarantee for next year at all. After the Checo announcement, it disgusted me really when that thing came out that apparently Horner is protecting Ricardo from Lawson. It's like, oh, so you're scared yes. that you might actually put a junior in the team that's designed for juniors. But then this is a team that seems to keep everyone forever because I think. I think Buemi is still contracted to them. I mean, he only joined as a junior in, what, 2006? And he hasn't raced for them in 13 years, but he's still contracted doing simulator work and young driver's tests when he's, what, 35 now or something? They just don't... This is a team that is just really bad at letting people go. Like, it, it, or they've become really bad at that when they used to fire people every 10 seconds. Um, but now... What was supposed to happen is that Checo just gets fired and retires because no one wants him. Um, Tsunoda goes to Red Bull, and then you get Lawson in um, Toro Rosso with either Hadyar or Iwasa, I guess. Uh, one of those. And, and now we're probably, it's probably just going to get Ricardo re-signed again. And because and Lawson, I think he said he doesn't even know where he fits anymore, like within the team structure and their plans. It's like, well, what's, what, where am I in all of this? Um, he fits on the sixth seat going from the right on the pit wall. That, that's where he's been sat at for a few races now, and it doesn't seem like that seat is going to go from the pit wall to a car anytime soon. He must be born out of his skull, because like he's not racing, just like Doohan, but with Doohan, they're at least being quite proactive with him. I mean, they were praising him to, to no end in Monaco. They're like, oh, we flew him to Endstone to do some simulation, then he came back to Monaco overnight before the race or whatever. Um, this is when that... Lawson has honestly has to start looking at WEC or something because that's the future for a lot of things and he, he can that's what Drogovic does. Drogovic is racing for Cadillac at, in hypercar at Le Mans. So he's finally if, decided he needs he needs to do something instead of waiting for Stroll or Alonso to leave. Which will not happen either of them. Yeah. <laughs> None of them. I can't you know, it's like at this at this point, it's like, do you, like he was what it was what, two years ago he won the F two title, Drogovic. Like everyone, the moment's gone, everyone's forgotten about that. I mean, poor Chair is very lucky that David Malukas broke his wrist and he's now ended up in with McLaren. But then also Callum, no Callum, oh he's there instead of Callum Eilot. Um Yeah, that's a whole that's a whole other thing that the I was trying to remember now with poor Chair because um, we've seen. Okay, complete topic change, but I need to mention this about Canapino in IndyCar because someone mentioned this in the server in the week and Paul, and the way Paul Chair is involved because he had some coming together with Augustin Canapino, whose fans are psychopaths, it seems, because they came after Callum Eilat last year for some a similar incident. And because of because of death threats against Paul Chair, now he's lost uh Canapino has actually lost his seat because of what his fans have done in IndyCar. Is kind of yeah, they, they've um, terminated their sponsorship with Junkos and who've also yeah, parted um, ways with McLaren. They had a commercial partnership or alliance with McLaren, and that's ended as well, or something. Yeah, all of that has happened because somehow those Argentinian ultras are worse than the Spanish Alonso ultras. And yeah, Kaido, you, you will know a lot about how bad those are, but what we're talking open death threats on like Twitter where anyone can see. So not just the, the, the implied ones, the very express ones. And the, the weirdest part of it is 
Porsche just overtook him like aggressively and caused something, but for some reason, the Argentinian fans have been sent into a, I don't know, some kind of spiral because of it. I mean, I never he's saw not even good, by the way. Gapino is not even a, a fan. I know he sucks. He's a midfielder. Like, I, I can't. I never saw it. Maybe it's because I don't see the like Spanish or you know Latin side of Twitter. I never saw any of that. I didn't see. Um, whichever race it was last year when he had a clash with Callum Eilat and they came after him as well. I never saw any of that. Um, I did, I've forgotten what the tweet was now. I tweeted something about Senna. I think I was complaining about this and just everyone like, because in Canada, they, they they made the rumble strips that turned two yellow and green to honour Senna. And I was like, okay, now this is a bit much because this is not like, this is not one of his big tracks that people remember. He's won, he won there twice in nine attempts. Um, and I think I did something like that, and I had a bunch of Brazilians just being like, "Please kill yourself" or something, <laughs> to, saying oh, we don't yeah. we don't need to keep commemorating Senna constantly because we're within you know three months of his birthday or his death day or whatever. I don't know, but just yeah, let, he's dead. We get it. Like every other driver that's dead never gets this much attention. Like it, it it's literally Circuit Gilles Villeneuve. Oh, here's a tribute to Senna. Am like, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. No, look, I, I think Senna is one of the greatest drivers ever. There's no doubt that his death has elevated his status, even though he's a genius. He's well, he may well be the quickest driver that ever lived. He's a god of motorsport, but his death definitely elevated his status. Ron Dennis has said the same thing, by the way. That's Ron Dennis's words. The internet is on YouTube, if you think I'm lying. And I can link it to anyone that questions me. I wanted to just say two really quick things, really quickly, okay? Uh, on the case of ultras fans, um, the Latin, Spanish, perhaps Argentine contingent, and if you're listening, you're out of control. And I don't appreciate it because I want to travel to Spain and I want to be able to show my face one day. And when people from Oviedo are saying, I dare you to come and visit, it'll be the last trip you ever take. I don't feel safe about that. So everyone just like take a deep breath, okay? Just take a deep breath, like to all the ultras, like the Spanish ultras, Argentine ultras, like we're all friends here. The second thing I want to say is just quickly on the Red Bull point. There's one aspect of Perez being resigned and Ricardo being resigned that I don't think we touched on, and it is the internal political struggle at Red Bull between Helmut Marco and Christian Horner. And I believe that many outlets came out and said that because Perez was so strongly supportive of Horner, and historically Ricardo has been as well. Since Horner actually came out of this political battle stronger than Marco, this strengthened the positions of Perez and Ricardo as well. So there's also other things that have happened, which have strengthened, additionally strengthened both underperforming drivers' status and positions in the team, in my opinion, from what I've read. And it seems like Horner has an excellent relationship with Perez. His comments are incredibly kind towards Sergio anytime he does anything wrong. And he has, we know Horner has an excellent relationship with Ricardo. So I think Horner is also thinking, I want guys who will back me if anything like that happens again. I don't want guys who are Marco's guys. You know, you know what I get? You know what I mean, guys? Yeah. Is Yoss still banned from the paddock? Because I feel like we haven't heard much from him recently. Because this all died down after Jeddah, and that was like three months ago now. Like it all just it all just disappeared. But yeah, I feel like we don't hear much from I mean Helmet's still around, obviously, but Yoss has quietened down quite a lot. Good question. Um, I haven't seen him. Yeah, I don't know if he's even in the paddock much now. We don't see him so often. Maybe they killed him, and that's why Ricardo... Kelly and Maybe Penelope Ricardo are suddenly killed... there all the time. Maybe Ricardo killed him, and that's why he gets to stay. They sent him on there. Yeah, I'm just convinced that Checo yeah. knows all their deepest secrets, and that's half the reason he's got... He's there. I don't know. He's just trying to keep the families good, because uh, Newey's on his way out, but I, I doubt Newey cares about set scanners because he's far too busy scrolling over his drawing board to care about who's sleeping with who and all of that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that, that leads us to um, just the final segment where we just think about our top three drivers of the race. So who who are your top three um, contenders? Because it was a hectic race. Some drivers did shine. Uh, well, okay. Well, there's not much to say on them, but we never mentioned Sauber, but maybe that's for a reason. <laughs> um <laughs> I can't there, say there's a reason. reason. I yeah. wanted to skip them. Yeah, Bot okay, Bottas, okay, pit lane start. Bottas did absolutely nothing, finished 13th, which is what he always does. Joe had another two minute pit stop, got lapped twice, unlapped himself, was still a lap down, so couldn't do anything and finished 14th. Bam. 
fifteenth, whatever it was. I don't know. Yeah, they, 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 yeah, they could have done. They could have tried. They could have done wets because they were starting from the pit lane or tried something interesting, and neither of them did anything. So yeah, Sauber. Yeah, the official name of that team is uh, Kick Sauber, and uh, I, I petition that we kick Sauber out of Formula One. Frankly, um, just call them Team Team Who with a question mark. Teams. Just who? who? Yeah, they're just so unthinkably invisible. Although didn't didn't Joe I, crash him? Joe crashed. No, like, no, Joe, Joe, his Joe crashed, crashed in FP1, crashed. and then yeah, he crashed in FP1 and FP3, and I think that's that's a big talking point. But just that, that's not good because I genuinely think he is in the running for like a rogue seat next year. I know it seems mad, but just with his sponsors and all, I really think he is. And I used to defend him a lot in 2022 because his pace was good, but when. I, just when his pace started improving, Alpha started going down. 2023, there or thereabouts, nothing impressive. But then 24, this year, for some reason, he's struggling much more, which is weird. When he was always that driver who was so invisible that he wouldn't even crush. So, yeah, I'm not too sure what's going on there. But I think we've all but said goodbye to Joe in F1 now because that, that, that wasn't a good showing at all. Well, maybe, as Kevin says, one race is not enough, but... He needs to at least be invisible, not cause red flags in two sessions. If he, I, wants I think at this point he might be worse than Sergeant because, like, yeah, he he got not he was behind him in qualifying, and the thing is, after Sergeant had his first offer, he just went into the wall and reversed out. Within a few laps, he caught back up to Joe, who was like ten seconds in front of him. Like he just, yeah, Joe, Joe, his pace, he was just his pace was nowhere, and Bottas, God knows, I mean, he should have left years ago. He never should have been at Mercedes half the time as well, but he's still here. Um, and next year, it's like, well, if maybe they'll get science. If they, in the interest of you know actually moving things along properly, they should take Zane Maloney, but that probably won't happen. Um, it's but there's not. It's just there's there's nothing. There's not yeah, much to say. Totally. There's nothing. Yeah. There's so little to, little to cover because they just don't do anything. Yeah, I mean, it's so obvious. The problem with Sauber was Raikkonen and Joe Benazzi. I mean. Look at how good they've been since then. I mean, there's two incredible drivers they have now. Look at the team now. It's achieving amazing results. Not. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a pathetic team. It's uh, absolutely the most anonymous team, as we've all said here. And, um, you know, Peter, you had a quote last episode about the difference between Sauber and the difference between Williams. And I think that's very pertinent here. It's just that, you know, I don't even think they care. At Sauber, I just think they're waiting for the Audi transition. It really feels like that. So pathetic. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I don't know what where where they're going to reach, or maybe they're they're going to be a contender for flop of the race then. But go, going back to our tops and flops, who are your top three drivers of the race then? Uh, okay, well, Max was the best driver overall. Um, Albon was doing really well until he got assassinated by um, Science, um, and maybe just Stroll. Because he managed to do nothing, which is a victory in itself with him, and just put his head down and, and did his job. I'm going to go. It's a very good list. It's very convincing. Um, let me play a little bit of devil's advocate. I'll go with Max, like Peter, for the best driver. That's pretty obvious. He was sensational. Um, number two, I'm going to go with Fernando Alonso. Because he didn't actually make too many mistakes this race, and he held off a Mercedes for, I don't know how many laps that was. That's super impressive. And then actually third, I'm going to give it to Esteban Ocon, because he gave Gasly that position. And he made an incredible middle stint where he like extended his tires for like 37 laps or whatever. It was more than that, uh, on, I believe on the inters, or was it on the mediums? I think it was the inter tire that he went like over 37 laps on them. So that's unbelievable. And, um, but I can easily see Stroll being included in that, um, as well as Albon. It's just that Albon didn't finish the race. So I have a hard time giving it to him, no matter how he was taken out. He didn't really finish the race. So, uh, but either one of those choices for two and three, I think, would, would work between our lists. And my top three, again, Max, because that's, that's a banker. He he was so much faster than anyone and so much more reliable than anyone. But my second one is Ocon for the same reasons as Kevin said. He actually drove from P18 to P9 and 
quite, you know, fairly so. He made this extremely long intermediate stint last and do well. So um, he did everything he could have done. My third one is just Haas's gamble to start on wets because I really, really do respect that. They, they did something that, uh, as I said, teams do not seem to want to do anymore, just take gambles. Again, not too sure why no one went on softs at the end when you had, everyone had an opportunity to put softs on for 12 laps. No one did. God knows why. So yeah, Haas did take a gamble. My flop of the race is harsh, but it's again Haas because I have no idea. I, well, Peter did give me um, a bit of an idea, but I'm, I don't agree at all with them pitting Magnussen when he was fourth. I really think they, they should have risked it. And if, if you have nothing to play for and you, you could survive with a point or two, you take those gambles and they didn't. Mm. Uh, so as for my flop, you could pick anyone out of Checo, George, Lando, Sergeant, Bottas, Joe, Haas, Alpine, Sauber. Small thing on George. We, 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 we let him off a bit. He started P1 and he might in a few minutes be P5 entirely by fault of his own. So like if he gets a penalty. So that, that was really bad. But yeah, go on. Yeah, Lewis, um, Ricardo, Sunoda, Science, Science, Leclerc, Ferrari, yeah, Pirelli, probably, um, yeah, Any Jacques Villeneuve, no, yeah, no, Jacques Villeneuve, Jacques 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 the weather, <laughs> that weird yeah. fat guy yeah. singing the national anthem at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but that bad guy. That what the hell was going on? The like Michelin Man or whatever it was. Like, what the hell was that? Like. Not, not sure. Why did yeah. they? And also the the guitar guy who's playing like one note every five seconds, but who's moving like a rock star. The both of them were hilarious. And no this really, really subdued, undramatic version of O Canada sung in a really bad key as well for that guy. <laughs> it was just funny coming off that because before, if if you'd watched the Sky Sports coverage, um. Uh, they got Martin Brundle in the gridwalk. He did this amazing interview with this woman called Mary McGee. She was in a wheelchair, but she'd raced motorbikes for over 60 years and she was coming to the race or something. I'd never heard of her. Um, and he just had this really nice interview with her and they'd obviously arranged to do this. And it's like, well, it's better than bloody Megan T. Sally and all these other like Zuma rappers that no one over the age of 16 has heard of or whatever. Like that was, yeah, they, they'd done that. And then suddenly you get this really, they can't ever just do a national anthem normally. The only ones that do it normally are the Italians. Now everyone else has to make it different and weird. But the, this one I don't get at all. He, he was just weird. That, that guy is weird. And we will it's, have it at not... Spain. We'll probably have someone playing it with like a nose flute while doing a river dance or something. I mean, re remember the Belgian Grand Prix guy? That clip is everywhere now. But this guy who seems. Is it a guy? I'm not even sure it's a guy. I'm really sorry. I think he was the one I was sense. convinced. He, I was convinced he was going to be the following year's Eurovision entry. He was wearing a cape or yeah. something, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he's wearing a, cl a cape and he's got this like, um, yeah, bl black, yellow, and red costume. And every driver is trying to not laugh, and then there's Alonso just laughing. <laughs> and we had, I think, like, last year, Silverstone, we had Damien Lewis, of all people, that I didn't even know was a singer, doing the national anthem with a saxophone accompanying him. I was like, I don't know where this comes from. It makes me think maybe there's a position to have me play the bassoon one one year as the national anthem. They'll get me in if that <laughs> if that national anthem video ever blows up for them. I mean, it won't. It's on like six thousand views. Um, yeah, they can't do it. The Austria and Italy they do it normally because they just get an orchestra and an opera singer. And America still does it. Like, well, actually, the Indy Five Hundred they got Jordan Sparks who won American Idol like fifteen years ago to do the. A, a classic rendition of the Star Spangled Banner that goes on for about 20 minutes, but yeah. Spain did a piano last year, which was smart because they don't have any lyrics, so you can actually just use a piano. So that, that Yes, nice. yeah. Yes, Formula 1 continues to find ways to embarrass itself. So, uh, you know, we look forward to more of that in the future. And uh, frankly speaking, this was a wild weekend. A lot happened. Hopefully we can have more weekends like this uh, on and off the circuit. So if I have to wrap everything up, in my opinion, give the race um an eight out of ten that's probably low for most people but um it had pretty much everything you could ask for i just think there were too many driver errors for me to put it at right at the top but i give it eight out of ten what do you guys think i give it a nine honestly because it's it's been a while since i've enjoyed my, myself on watching a race 
um maybe it's the company because i watched it with a few friends it was nice but it was just a really really fun race every single lap there was something to talk about there was there was not a single lap i would say where there was not something to point out um even for neutral or like you know casual fan so um that was my like even when nothing was happening hamilton chasing alonso was fun um and then when they there seemed to be another lull science just decides to spin so yeah nine out of ten and maybe even nine point nine and a quarter out of ten if george had like crashed into lando or hamilton it would have been a 10 i think for me but we had <laughs> yeah more accidents especially someone crashes from the lead or whatever that could have knocked it up but yeah i was just grateful for the fact that race control actually let the race go ahead um and didn't yes. say oh let's you know let's wait well, let's wait for the circuit to dry and then let's spend 20 minutes behind the bloody safety car it's like no just go even though nobody knows what the track's going to be like um they, the they let it the start, were you guys also surprised that no one went off yeah i was i was the first lap i was like this is very gentlemanly and i was like everyone is driving a bit too well and then logan Sargent happens and it's and then and well, you realize yeah, the even gap. at the start so, sergeant did cut turn one so i found that really funny because i i was expecting a, a, i was expecting a spinner somewhere but nobody did yeah so so, so sergeant cut turn one but i was like I, I was saying all of my friends this is gonna end up in a in a crash we, we literally saw a driver upside down there um a few years ago i mean well, Ga Ga gasly decades. did gasly did spin actually and hit checo at the beginning a little bit but um, yes other than yeah. that not really who was upside well, he down hit, he hit, he hit yeah. ghastly and then he put him back on track but yeah you know, basically i really expected a crush and i was like why are you guys being so nice to each other the, the, this mm. is like a bottleneck of a turn one that goes into like this thingy shanghai thingy and mm. you're not you're not crushing to each other so yeah anyway nice race really enjoyed it yeah and uh i mean yeah Onward and upward to uh, to Spain in two weeks, which somehow is the tenth race of the year. When in my mind it should be fourth or fifth, but but hey ho. Um, you've been listening to the DRS Train podcast. We're on YouTube and Spotify, and you can find us on Instagram and X at the DRS Train podcast. Stay safe. Make sure to tune in for our next episode, and we'll see you all next time.